you're in detail. At present, funeral homes in St. Lucia are subject to a VAT at the standard rate of 12.5% on all transactions related to the provision of funeral services. This includes the cost of coffin or casket, storage and preparation of the body for the funeral, transportation and her services, and the provision of other burial-related services. Burial costs in St. Lucia are an average, Mr. Speaker, $8,000, but can range from $2,700 to upwards of $18,000. Depending on a number of variables, such as whether a coffin is used or a casket, the number of days of storage of the body, and other funeral-related expenses, such as leaflets, corsages, frame photos, badges, and so on. It is the intention of this government to bring some relief to the people of St. Lucia as it relates to the funeral-related expenses. Most of funeral homes in St. Lucia tend to bundle their services and offer packages. Therefore, it would have been impractical to itemize components of funeral home expenses and provide waivers on specific aspects of this expenditure. This government considered all available options for relief and has determined that this be the most suitable option. The effects of a zero rating of the exempt VAT on the supply of the funeral home services differ in terms of the cost to the provider, to the customer, and to the government. Furthermore, the inclusion of the funeral home expenses on the VAT exempt list would result in an additional cost to the funeral homes which they would not be able to claim any input on VAT expenses. Therefore, input VAT expenses would likely be passed on to the customer, resulting in higher customer costs while the net effect of your funeral homes would remain the same. Five, as such, this government has decided to include as a zero rated goods that are part of funeral package provided by a funeral home and that payable by the clients to the funeral homes usually range from $100 to $2,000 per funeral package. Let me repeat that again, Mr. Speaker. That payable by the clients to the funeral homes usually range from $100 to $2,000 per funeral package. Our government believes that the waiver of VAT on funeral home expenses will be passed on to the customers. And this will provide much needed relief to the families of the deceased as they make preparations for the burial of their dead and loved ones at a very difficult time. Another vexing issue, Mr. Speaker, with respect to utility reconnections. The reconnection fee for the Water and Sewage Company Limited, WASCO, 
is $112.50, whilst the reconnection fee for the St. Lucia Electricity Services Company is $25. The VAT payable on reconnections are therefore $14.06 and $3.13 respectively. At present, the supply of electricity and water and sewage are zero rated in St. Lucia, whilst reconnection fees are VAT payable. This government recognizes that households usually allow their water electricity service to become disconnected when they are facing significant hardship and are unable to meet all of their monthly expenses. As such, this government has made the decision to waive the VAT on water and electricity reconnections in an effort to provide further relief to the people of St. Lucia. The actual amounts of the waiver may appear as insignificant, but we are confident that this relief will be well received by the households which will benefit from these waivers. And let us not remember, forget, Mr. Speaker, that the ability to be disconnected several times in a year is not uncommon. So while the savings we've identified is on per reconnection, remember in some cases, people go through this process, unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, multiple times in a year. Mr. Speaker, the resolution seeks additional VAT waivers for the Huonora Airport Redevelopment Project. You'll recall that a previous sitting of the House, we sought VAT exemptions for the HIA Redevelopment Project, and those were granted via Statutory Instrument 103 of 2019. The exemptions at the time would cover the import of goods or services for the Huonora International Airport Redevelopment Project for a period of four years. However, the treatment of VAT on the contract between St. Lucia Air and Seaports Authority, SLASPA, and the St. Lucia branch of the Overseas Engineering and Construction Company, OECC, of the Republic of China, Taiwan, was not explicitly addressed. Neither was the treatment of VAT on contracts between the OECC and its subcontractors, and the related local purchases of goods and services for the project. As such, a statutory instrument will be prepared to include the contracting service by OECC to SLASPA for the HIA redevelopment project on the first schedule to the VAT Act, this will cause the OECC, the OECC contract service to become exempt from the payment of VAT by SLASPA, as well as services by companies subcontracted by the OECC to work on the HIA redevelopment project. From a previous sitting of the House, you may recall that the contract between the government of St. Lucia and Exim Bank is such that the services rendered using funds from the loan should be tax-free. The tax-free nature of the agreement is such that only VAT payable to the Inland Revenue Department or the Customs and Excise Department or any imports and or subcontracted services as it relates to the HIA redevelopment project shall be deemed exempt from tax. Mr. Speaker, we are here today to make the necessary legislative amendments to ensure waiver of the VAT on the HIA redevelopment project in all aspects. Mr. Speaker, the resolutions before the Parliament seek approval for the zero rating of the contracting services for the road rehabilitation service for the road rehabilitation project in which the government of St. Lucia has entered into contractual relations with the Overseas Engineering and Construction Company, OECC, of the Republic of China, Taiwan, and of the inclusion of related parts of the project to the third schedule of the value added tax. The government of St. Lucia has entered into a contractual arrangement with OECC for the road improvement and the maintenance program in the amount of United States dollars, 42 million, not inclusive of taxes. This tax-free contract is in keeping with the terms of the loan for funds from the Exim Bank. The tax-free nature of the agreement is such that any VAT payable to the Inland Revenue Department or the Customs and Excise Department on any imports necessary for the road rehabilitation project shall be deemed exempt Non-payment of VAT by the OECC on the subcontracted work as per VAT inclusive contracts already signed and the likelihood that some of the subcontractors may be desirous of obtaining duty and other concessions on purchasing of equipment associated with executing related subcontracts on behalf of the OECC. This too shall be exempt from the value added tax. The OECC being a duly registered subsidiary of St. Lucia is engaging various subcontractors 
undertake various lots of road construction works. The OECC is desirous of purchasing machinery and equipment including vehicles in its capacity as the main contractor for the execution of works under the contract. The road work rehabilitation will be executed over 128 calendar weeks. To date, the OECC has signed at least five subcontracts and within the next 30 months is expected to sign 20 more. Given the scope of works and the number of subcontracts that the government is seeking, the consideration of this parliament to waive this tax is under, under contract. So Mr. Speaker, we have come with several amendments to be able to, one, bring relief on some very vexing issues that the public of St. Lucia have had, and also in order to facilitate the continual implementation of a major infrastructural development of the Hunora International Airport, as well as the uh, road redevelopment. And I wanted to know that these courtesies and waivers are not only being extended, Mr. Speaker, to the OECC, but also to the multitude of local contractors that hopefully will be gainfully employed under these programs. I ask for Parliament's approval. Honourable Members, the question is that Parliament by affirmative resolution approves the draft value added tax amendment of Schedules 1 and 3, Number 2 order, which amends Schedules 1 and 3 of the Act. A, in case of Schedule 1, 1, under Item 1, to include the definitions for the words funeral package and funeral home. 2, under Item 2, 1, to include as a zero-rated good the supply of goods that forms part of a funeral package provided by a funeral home. 3, under Item 2, 2, to include as a zero-rated service the supply of A, a service that forms part of a funeral package provided by the funeral home. B, a service directly related to the rec reconnection of water provided by the Water and Sewage Company, Incorporated Wasco. C, a service directly related to the reconnection of electrical energy provided by the St. Lucia Electricity Services Company Limited. D, a service under the, under the contract between contract agreement between the St. Lucia Air and Seaports Authority and the Overseas Engineering and Construction Company. LTDASA OECC for the Hiranoa International Airport Redevelopment Project. E, a service under the contract between agreement between the government of St. Lucia and the Overseas Engineering and Construction Company, LTDASA OECC for the Road re Improvement and Maintenance Program Phase 4. B, in case of Schedule 3, to exempt imported goods and services for the road improvement and maintenance program phase four for the period commencing from the 31st day of May 2019 and terminating on the 12th day of November 2021. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this afternoon we are back on the fat wagon and the government has failed again to meet its promise to the electorate to eliminate VAT. A promise, a solemn promise made to the people of St. Lucia several times, the reduction and the gradual and the elimination of VAT. So we are here today to do the normal piecemeal. Last the last time you were here, we had a wave of VAT on educational supplies. Now we are here with another waiver. All because the government has failed in its promise to the electorate of the country to eliminate VAT as they, as they said. And I, will be, and I will be holding the government to account for its failure to eliminate VAT. Um, the, this, this government's term of office will come to an end constitutionally by August, September 2021, and they have not eliminated VAT, a promise that they made to the people of this country. But we are here this, this, this afternoon with an, another piecemeal measure. 
But Mr. Speaker, there, there is, I will not comment on the first part of, of, of the motion. I will not comment on it. But I will comment, if you allow me to, Mr. Speaker, to comment on sections D and E. Mr. Speaker, we are being called upon to forego revenue on a contract agreement between the St. Lucia Air and Seaport Authority and the Overseas Engineering Construction Company, OEC, OECC, for the United International Airport Redevelopment Project. The Minister of Finance, he stated the sum of the, the cost of the waiver for all the other items. He said for, for item number E, it would cost $42 million. But he never said the cost of the waiver for item number D. He did not say how much would the waiver of that cost for item number D. But Mr. Speaker, what is even more striking is that, and I, I hold no issue with, with the company. I know nothing about them. And the competence, I am not questioning the competence. But the point is, Mr. Speaker, the public of St. Lucia, and I stress the word public, will have a debt of excess of $600 million for an airport redevelopment program, a choice of the government, the government's choice. And the public does not know how the contractor was chosen. We have no idea. We've never seen any, any tender document for how the contractor was chosen. So I have to take the word of the government that the contractor was chosen in an open and transparent manner. This government, through their own deliberate choice, decided that they would borrow money to build the airport. But they, they could not at least put up for, in pub for public tender for the contractor to build the airport. How do I know that another contractor could not have built the airport at a cheaper price? In the arrangement that Barbados just entered last week, they listed the contractors who tendered for the construction of the airport. But in St. Lucia, we have to take the faith of the government, believe in the government, that they just choose a contractor. Again, I am I'm not questioning the competence of the contractor. I don't know who the contractor is. I have a responsibility to the taxpayers of the country for the government to count on how the contractor was chosen. I do not know what is the value of that exemption. Because I was told the value of the exemption for all the other items except the airport. But we've, come, we've appointed a contractor. Mr. Speaker, that cannot be right. It cannot be right that apart from inflicting that debt on the people of St. Lucia, we now are causing a loss of revenue. And if you have to go by the government's estimate, $600 million at the airport, 12.5% of that. We are waiving that. I'm not even entering the merits or, or the demerits of the waiver. I am saying to you that we have absolutely no evidence. We have no evidence on how the contractor was chosen. So I'm left to speculate on how the contractor was chosen. Because the government has never told the people of St. Lucia how the contractor was chosen. On item number E, Mr. Speaker, local contractors before have built roads under design finance bill contracts. They've never had a waiver of that. Again, I do not know how the contractor was chosen 
for the road maintenance program. I saw no tender. I have no idea how it was chosen. I have no idea how the subcontractors were, were, were chosen. The Prime Minister comes and says that subcontractors were chosen for three already have been chosen, or five, or whatever he said, and 20 will be chosen sometime next year, 2021, or, or, or whatever he says. Who are they? How were they chosen? Did they tender? Was it the lowest tender? Could, uh, could another contractor do it for the same price? What roads are these contractors building? What roads are they building? Where are the roads? But we, but we, are, we just have to, to take the word of the government. I mean, and he says $42 million, Mr. Speaker. It's the money, taxpayers' money. And, and we, think, we think it's a joke. Taxpayers' money. $42 million worth of debt. And we have absolutely no idea how these contractors were chosen. No idea. Must I just listen to the word of, 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 of the government? Just take their word for it? I can't. And the people and the people of Indonesia should not. This government from the inception in 2016, April 2016, in that budget of promises, they've made the point that they're going to be rehabilitation of roads. The government did not have the time to at least tender for these roads so the public of Indonesia would know that the government is fixing X, X roads, that level of of road at that cost. But we just have to, it, I mean, not even, this government promised to run the country as a business. Not even a business we run like that. This, this is not anybody's backyard, or anybody's private concern, that you take $42 million and you wave that and you say, and I have no idea how you chose the contractors for that, for that project, Mr. Speaker. And a lot more will be said on these contractors and these projects. But this is not the right place to say it, Mr. Speaker. Because something, there's got to be a lot more transparency in the use of government money. This money doesn't belong to any of us inside of here. 42 million US dollars. And we have no idea. We, we just have to take the word that you, you sat in a cabinet and you decided on X contractor and I must take your word for it. This can't be right. It can't be right, Mr. Speaker. But this government believes. They believe. So the objective is you will tell people that I fix the roads for you. But how do the people know that these roads could not have been built at a more affordable cost? How do the people know that they are getting value for money? Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, this government they take no blame for anything. What they, they live in a world of fantasy and in a world of praising themselves. Self-fulfilled self -fulfilled prophecy. Anytime, anytime you bring to the government something that's wrong, they tell you, you did it too. That is the only excuse. So they bring an example in their own minds that you did it too. But the people of St. Lucia wanted a change. They wanted to stop the wrong things that they thought that the, pe that the Labour Party was doing. And we have admitted, we have taken our place in the opposition. But you cannot commit these sins and fall back. You did it too. You did it too. That, oh, oh, you were there and, and you did it too. The point Mr. Is Speaker, the on a slight point there of order. There are $42 million worth of position. There are $42 position. million. Dollars. He has indicated what's that he's standing on a point of order. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, on a slight point of order. Standing order 35 1. Honorable Member. Yes. Honorable. Mr. Speaker, I think that the member continuously violates standing order 35 1, where it states that we must confine our debate to the contents that is being discussed. I think what we're discussing here is whether he's in favor are not in favor of removing VAT for the construction of the airport. And that's what it is. These are the comments here. Is he going to discuss VAT and funerals? Is he going to discuss VAT and the reconnection of electricity bills? That's what we're talking about. 
we've, we've exhausted the discussion on debt for the airport, and I think he's abusing the latitude of the House. We've been very cooperative, but I think in the interest of time. I remember. Leader of the Opposition. Yes, sir. The, um, I've given you some. You could, you, you could stand. I have given you some latitude, but I will continue. Mr. Speaker, we are speaking. We are speaking about waiver of VAT for the airport and for the construction of roads. And I'm saying to this honorable house that I do not know how the government chose the contractors to build the roads. That's all I'm saying. I do not know how. And I'm saying I'm not sure whether we could have waived less VAT or more VAT. And I'm saying that the government had enough time to put to tender for the construction of these roads. Mr. Speaker, I will not be intimidated by people who want me to keep quiet on issues that the people of St. Lucia elected me to deal with, Mr. Speaker. And they want to hear me because they are the ones who will pay the money. None of us inside here, none of us inside here will be alive when these debts are going to be paid. None of us. But we sit and we behave as if it's our... It's our, we sit here and we, we sit here and we behave as if it is, as if it, it, it is our money. None of us will be here. None of us. You understand? We sit here and we, we pretend and we laugh because the taxpayers of this country are not laughing. They are the ones who are going to pay these debts. Not you. Or, or not me. We are going to pay it. And you don't want us to, to make you refuse to at least listen and take into consideration what we're saying as it relates to this non-tendering for these jobs, Mr. Speaker. And I will insist that this government is going wrong. And I cannot trust the judgment in these things. I do not know whether they are choosing the right contractors. I do not know whether you are getting the value for money. I would have known if there was an open tender. I would have known if tenders were open and people would have, would have been allowed to bid and a contractor would have been chosen. I would have been more comfortable, Mr. Speaker. So I'm not comfortable. Further, Mr. Speaker, I want to know, in the construction of the airport, how will local, will, what is in there for the local suppliers of goods and services? Now, would, Mr. Leader of the Opposition, you're going out of the... The, the, the confines that have. Mr. Speaker, in the case of Schedule 3, to exempt imported goods and services for the road improvement. Yes, I accept that and I read that. Um, but now I think to, to start questioning how the local suppliers and will be. No, I think you're going beyond it now. Even though it says imported, Mr. Speaker? I don't have an issue with what is written. What's written is what's written. I'm saying the, the tangent now you're going. That's what I'm saying. Continue. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I will listen, although I will listen to your directives, and I hope other people listen also, because in this house, all of us are supposed to be equal. The majority is supposed to to listen to the speaker the same way as the minorities. So I hope when you make these, these rulings, the majority listens. But, but Mr. Speaker, I, I'm not, I do not trust the government to, for to, to have that level of expenditure without tendering. I believe that if you're going to waive that, now it's almost, it will be purely about, nearly a, about a billion dollars if you, when you work it out. And we are just being called to just listen to the government, contractors chosen in cabinet, contractors chosen in, anyhow 
Five contractors, five, five local contractors. Who are they? No one knows. Twenty more. Who are they? No one knows. Considering the history of how these contracts have been given in the last two and a half years. So, Mr. Speaker, I still await the government's elimination of VAT. I await it. I await the government's promise to eliminate VAT. And unless the government eliminates VAT, the government has failed, to, has failed the people of St. Lucia. They failed them because they made a solemn promise and that promise has not been, has not been delivered to the people of St. Lucia. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I cannot, in all good judgment, I can't, in all good judgment, sit in this honorable house and allow this government to put the country in that level of debt for an airport and road maintenance without the people of St. having any say in how the contractors were chosen. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Social Saldivas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, before I um, provide my support for the resolution in front of us here today, I would just like to commend you for taking the initiative and having the cabinet um, follow your lead. Parliament, Parliament. Parliament sorry. Follow your lead in um, solidarity with the NCP this, this morning. And um, all of us as parliamentarians would recognize that um, the following that we had this morning is only a fraction of the people with disabilities in our country. And um, it should not be just being visible with them this morning, but we actually you know, put action into what was um, expressed this morning, um, Mr. Speaker. I also would want to challenge every member in Parliament this morning that when we do, when we do um, anything as it relates to serving people with special needs, that we don't do it in any way to try to um, highlight ourselves, but do it through the spirit of what it was intended to be, Mr. Speaker. Many of us try to be visible for the wrong reasons. Um, Mr. Speaker, I just, as I said, support the resolution as stated by the Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, because as a parliamentary, rec um, as a parliamentary representative, we recognize, or I recognize rather, that funeral is big business. Funeral is big business in this country. From the various packages that are put together, to include private burial lots, Mr. Speaker, it adds to the agony when you lose a loved one. And as a parliamentary rep, we recognize the number of requests that comes to you as a parliamentary rep sometimes for various assistance in one way or the other um, in assisting some families who are unable to even bury their loved ones. So, as much as the, 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 the elimination of the, 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 the VAT on funeral packages have, been, have, have come forward, Mr. Speaker, um, and, and some may say it's, it, it may not be very significant, but who feels it knows it, Mr. Speaker? And I know many, many St. Lucians will appreciate what we have put forward there today to assist in terms of the, the, the cost of burials. In addition, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that we have also included in there the, 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 the elimination of that for reconnection of water and electricity. Mr. Speaker, this is also a, a, a very burning um, topic that has come to many of us as parliamentary reps as it relates to, you know, um, if we cannot even pay our bills, how can we pay for a reconnection plus a VAT? So it is something I am very sure the citizenry who are mostly affected would, would benefit and welcome. 
Mr. Speaker, I, I, I speak to um, some of the issues that was raised by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition as he, as he, as he seemed to be focusing mainly on how the, the contractor was appointed rather than the issue of the, 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 issue of the, the, the VAT, Mr. Speaker. Um, as the Member of Parliament for Shozal Soldibus, I was one of the first, um, or my community rather, was one of the first communities to benefit under the um, road improvement and maintenance program. And it was the, the Saltibus Road was the road which was identified as a road that had long been neglected uh, from several administrations that, that, that we would have put um, as a priority under this program. And Mr. Speaker, while we had identified this road as one of the first projects, because of um, many issues not being totally resolved, which included the whole issue of um, this, this value added tax, there were quite a bit of delays, Mr. Speaker, in, in, in this road going forward as fast as it was supposed to have gone forward. So I welcome, Mr. Speaker, um, that this matter is being laid in Parliament today so that um, the time frame for the completion of this road could, could, um, could be met. Obviously, Mr. Speaker, um, the estimates for both the, the airport and the road improvement program was not done by the, the, the contractor, um, OECC. It was, they were, these, these estimates were done um, by SLASPA and also um, with the Ministry of Infrastructure as it relates to the road improvement program. And then, Mr. Speaker, the, as, as the member for the, the leader of the opposition seemed to, to, seem to be alluding to, maybe a, another contractor would have um, done it at a, at a cheaper rate and therefore, the, 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 in terms of what the country is losing from a VAT perspective, is one of the things that he's questioning, Mr. Speaker. But I think more importantly, what should be highlighted, Mr. Speaker, is, and he's right, we took a loan. A loan was taken for the project, and if VAT had to be factored into that loan, it would have been a lot more than what was actually um, had to be taken to, to, to serve. So, so we need to, 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 to be very you know, um, transparent when we're making um, our contribution and don't leave out you know, um, matters which I believe are, are critical in the debate. So, Mr. Speaker, I welcome the, the resolution that the Prime Minister has brought forward, and I, I, I'm sure it will benefit the entire country. So I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member for Ancillary Canaries. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity as we're closing the Parliament to wish my constituents all the very best for Christmas and also do the same to my parliamentary colleagues, especially my colleagues on the opposite side, my colleagues to the, the, my right. Um, Mr. Speaker, I wish them all of God's grace and the best for Christmas. Um, Mr. Speaker, I stand in support of this bill with uh, profound sadness Profound sadness, Mr. Speaker, in, in support of this motion. Because as we got into the debate, it, it is clear to me, Mr. Speaker, that while the government comes into the House to continue to seek ways and means uh, in trying to bring about a tax environment that is less burdensome to the people of the country, the leader of the opposition is not interested in debating and discussing the relief that is going to bring to his constituents uh, on funeral services being waived or uh, the reconnection fees to Wasco or to um, electricity services. He's more interested in playing politics. And this is, to me, Mr. Speaker, very disappointing. As I add my voice to this debate, that he certainly skipped um, a, B, and C, and then we went to D and E because he felt that there was political profit to be gained uh, from discussing those elements of the bill. And so, Mr. Speaker, when we do that, what we do, Mr. Speaker, is we create a, a moral scar 
on the conscience of our nation. And this is uh, the sad thing about our political reality in that it has gotten to such uh, a low, Mr. Speaker. I couldn't believe my eyes and I'm, I'm profoundly sad by what I've just seen here demonstrated by the Leader of the Opposition. But Mr. Speaker, in my support of this bill, as a, uh, just like my colleague from um, Chazelle Saltibus, what I have, um, what I have experienced, Mr. Speaker, as an MP, uh, being uh, the representative for a constituency such as ancillary canneries, is the fact that many families find it extremely difficult and burdensome uh, to uh, bury a loved one and to echo the phrase from my um, Chazelle Saltibus colleague, um, that when they are going through uh, such a critical bereavement, uh, a time, Mr. Speaker, when they would have lost loved ones, that they then have to confront with burdensome bills, such as funeral expenses. And Mr. Speaker, the expenses don't just stop at what they pay to the funeral parlor or other services, but they also demanded by our culture, Mr. Speaker, to create very lavish after parties as well. And, and this, Mr. Speaker, places a uh, significant strain on a lot of families to come up with expenses for funeral. So what this little uh, amendment has done, little but profound, is that, Mr. Speaker, it allows and it ensures family uh, the opportunity uh, to better afford uh, funeral expenses and to bury their loved ones, Mr. Speaker, at a time of great grief to the family. So, Mr. Speaker, I am in total support uh, for this bill, for this motion, Mr. Speaker, uh, especially the elements in point A where it says that uh, it is to remove the VAT on federal expenses. Uh, in point B, uh, particularly when it, where it spoke to the reconnection fees to water uh, services. Uh, and as well, Mr. Speaker, part C, is very critical as it relates to the reconnection of electricity services. Mr. Speaker, the reality is, is that many families can't pay their funeral bills. And you know, Mr. Speaker, this was made clear when I'm sure you would have seen the recent Al Jazeera report. And in that report, Mr. Speaker, we saw that uh, some uh, people affiliated with politicians were saying that how politicians in other Caribbean islands were using uh, passport monies to bury the dead and to help their constituents in various ways. Mr. Speaker, I hope today that my reference to the Al Jazeera report does not make anyone in this house nervous. But, Mr. Speaker, what I'm trying to say is that it is not just a St. Lucia reality, but it's a Caribbean reality where MPs like myself continue to find it extremely difficult, Mr. Speaker, to meet and assist our constituents in ways, Mr. Speaker, more than, uh, uh, not just with electricity services, not just with water supply, or not just with uh, funeral packages, but in, in a lot of ways, Mr. Speaker, and anything a government can do to help uh, to promote, Mr. Speaker, affordability for its citizens must be uh, commended. And so, Mr. Speaker, our decision in a recent parliament to reduce the VAT rate from 15% uh, to 12.5% is in keeping with our promise to the people of St. Lucia to give them a less burdensome tax environment. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it is clear, Mr. Speaker, as well, that this will no doubt, Mr. Speaker, um, continue to give people confidence in this government and continue to uh, allow for more consumer uh, consumption to take place. Mr. Speaker, when we uh, did the VAT reduction by 16%, 2.5 percentage points, uh, the opposition said that we were going to lose $50 million. We didn't lose $52 million. What instead happened, Mr. Speaker, is that year we collected more VAT receipts. Um, these measures here, Mr. Speaker, uh, does not have a significant impact 
on the fiscal situation or on the revenue side. So, Mr. Speaker, what you do find is that uh, the removal of the VAT from funerals, the Department of Finance reported that it was just uh, $500,000 in revenue for gone. So we see, Mr. Speaker, a very responsible approach being taken from the fiscal side uh, to ensure that it doesn't have that much of an implication on the revenues of the country. But what it does, Mr. Speaker, is quite clearly it shows empathy, it shows sympathy, Mr. Speaker, and most importantly, Mr. Speaker, it, get, it, it gets rid of uh, a message and a signal from a policy that was extremely oppressive to a lot of people, Mr. Speaker, who found it very difficult uh, at these times of whether reconnecting their electricity bills or water um, services or burying uh, loved ones. Mr. Speaker, as Tourism Minister, I must give my support to D and E of the bill, where it uh, more or less speaks to the removal of VAT for building materials on the airport and other um, VAT requirements and services for the construction to the Urinora International Airport. Mr. Speaker, this is a project that we require, and uh, this project, Mr. Speaker, is to ensure that um, this measure, rather, does allow, Mr. Speaker, for the project to be done in as cost-effective a manner as possible, so that uh, the burden that the leader of the opposition spoke to, and he likes to speak about debt, um, that that burden, that financial burden, is lessened as much as possible. So I give that my total support uh, when one considers the tremendous impact the uh, completion of the international airport will have on the further growth of the tourism sector. And Mr. Speaker, I embrace this fully. I am not going to, Mr. Speaker, play any politics um, on the eve of Christmas. And I am not going to, Mr. Speaker, meander into all kinds of positions. I, I just believe that we ought to confine our statements, Mr. Speaker, to the matters being discussed here. But in closing, I must reiterate, it is very, very sad to see uh, the leader of the opposition, who is from a very impoverished constituency, who represents, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, a number of residents that I know personally that struggles. And he refuses to comment on the fact that, you know, it will be easier for them to bury their loved ones. Mr. Speaker, it tells you the kind of man he is, and it tells you, Mr. Speaker, where his priority lies. It certainly doesn't lie in the service of people, but it lies in playing politics. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Castro, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to join other colleagues who have expressed thanks to you for ensuring that the Parliament of St. Lucia was associated with the event this morning. And I think both the Leader of the Opposition and members <coughs> on the government side express, you know, our common sentiments about the situation facing persons with disabilities in St. Lucia. And of course, I would also like to use this what I probably believe is the last sitting of Parliament to extend to yourself, Mr. Speaker, and all you need, parliamentary colleagues. Remember, you need to add for the year. For the year. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't sure you were thinking beyond the year, but um, the very best for the season and to my constituents that I do have whatever the season brings, they, they make the best of it. We do know that it is one of the most trying times for people in terms of the economic survival in this country. And Mr. Speaker, I would want to start off by saying that it is difficult for one to disagree with a measure which will make it to some extent cheaper for persons to be buried and to meet their funeral costs. But I noted that 
the, both the member for Ansari Canneries and Susan Sotiba spoke about the difficulty that some families face to bury their lost ones. And it is true. It's sometimes embarrassing when you have to sit across the table from a constituent who would tell you that they cannot even bury a mother or a father or some other relative. And there are families that have had to postpone funerals because they cannot meet the cost of a burial. But again, if you listen to the member from Ancillary Canaries, almost suggested that this measure will almost make it now affordable to bury lost ones. I think that's probably a little misguided if one should give that impression or if one gets that impression. Because if a burial cost, Mr. Speaker, is such that... Mr. Speaker, on a point of elucidation, just... Well, if it's elucidation, members, please, please allow me to continue. Yeah. There, there's no need yeah. for this. Uh, uh, but Mr. the, the Honourable Member is not giving away. Yeah. It's a festive season. Relax. Take it easy. Yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, I was making the point that if one really cared about those circumstances, it would surely, Mr. Speaker, be a lot more meaningful and impactful to have a provision in SSDF or somewhere, and with proper means tested, that families that cannot raise the monies, Mr. Speaker, can go there and actually get the support to bury their, their lost ones. Yes, you appreciate and you welcome 12.5% less. And Mr. Speaker, if it was $3,000, 12.5% less is probably about $360. But there are people that cannot even meet the reduced cost. And if we are going to have a concert on the weekend with Jackie for $300,000, I'm sure SSDF can do very well. Yeah, with, and I, I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, I do know that there is some assistance given. I know it. But there is so much of a greater demand. Because there are times when I call and I say, can you all assist somebody for burial? And say the money has already finished or the allocation has already finished. So I do know they do give some assistance. But it is insufficient. And if you really care about helping out those individuals, don't champion this discount as the solution to the problem, Mr. Speaker. Like I said, take the $300,000 for the Jack Your Concert and put it there where those people can really and truly benefit from it, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, electricity and water, similarly, Mr. Speaker, there are families, Mr. Speaker, and I know there are school children who cannot bathe, Mr. Speaker, sometimes to go to school because the water has been cut at their homes. Their parents, the mother or father cannot pay the water bill. That's reality in St. Lucia. So this is welcome, but it is attached to the reconnection fee. And it is, the, the, minister from, the member from Miko South said, it's probably only $14 or whatever, but it is welcome. But we have some deep social issues, Mr. Speaker. And I welcome the reduction because it will make life that less onerous, Mr. Speaker. But a lot can be done. A lot can be done. I do not think the member from Cassidy is opposed the motion. A lot more can be done by a more sensitive government. And especially... If that is eliminated entirely like was promised to the people of St. Lucia. So, Mr. Speaker, the point is, if you say to people that you are going to remove that, why did we put it? That was implemented and you promised the people to vote for you, you will remove it. And you have not removed it. You have not removed it. And therefore, you know, they always get edgy when I'm speaking. I'll continue, I'll continue. You don't need to stop the, the business of the house. The point I am making, and is a point that the people living in Central Lucia know, I am speaking the reality that life is hard in this country. There are families that cannot bury their lost ones. And if you want to proclaim you now care about poor people, and the people of Ancillary will now be happy because there is a reduction, all I am saying, there is more that can be done. And please do the more that can be done. It doesn't take a lot more. And I cited the Jack York concert for $300,000. Give it to SSDF and help poor people bury some of their loved ones. The leader of the opposition raised about the airport and the process of selection and trying to make sense of the true cost 
of the airports. And there is a legitimate point being made. And I think the member from um, Social Saltiber spoke about it. It is true that the airports, if one had to include VAT, the cost would be a lot more. And I'm assuming the cited figure of about 660 million EC dollars, about 225 million US, that the airports will cost us, will be a lot more if that had to be added. A lot more. So St. Lucia's need to reflect on the significance of that decision to upgrade the Euronor International Airport. Because you are now saying the figure we gave, the humongous figure of 660 million could actually have been 800 million if VAT was included. So I'm glad VAT is not included. But the question now becomes even deeper for one to reflect on. Why would you upgrade an airport whose true cost would have been 800 million and not 660 million? So there we are upset over the fact that you are taking a loan for 660 million whilst Barbados is taking the exact deal St. Lucia did not take. Jamaica took a similar deal. But it could have been worse. It could have been worse. It could have been worse. That fee could have been 800 million EC just to upgrade an airport. So, Mr. S you know, we, we need to note the point that the, 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 leader, the leader was making. On the matter of roads, my issue is slightly different. To be honest, I have no issue if VAT is exempted. I want the roads in Bassa Joseph and Marigo to be repaired. And if you go to Marigo, as you approach the hill, you'll see a big sign. Minister of Tourism, please fix the roads. And he has begged that the sign be taken down, but it will not be taken down. Because the people are incensed, and I heard you know, all attempts were made to try and get some people to take down the sign. The, the state of the roads, the state of the roads are deplorable in Marigo. And the honorable member did come, honorable rep, um, member of Kashmir's North did send a crew to come and do some patching. But the roads in Marigo are tourism site in St. Lucia. It's in a very poor state. A very poor state. And now all I'm saying, <clears throat> three and a half years, you said you would repair the roads, and they've not been repaired. And my concern is whether they have VAT exemption or no VAT exemption, the road in Marigo should be repaired. And the road in Bassa Joseph needs urgent attention. And in the coming year, if the road in Marigo is not attended to, I think the residents will let the authorities know exactly what they think of the conditions of their road. Exactly what they think of the conditions of their road. I stopped them a few months ago, but I'm not sure the next time I will stop them from letting the authorities know. So, Mr. Speaker, exemption or not, the roads of Bassa Joseph and Marigo should be repaired. But I think, as I take my seat, Mr. Speaker, I have to express that we see exemptions on VAT and people feel jubilant about it. But the state of living in this country is terrible right now. As we approach Christmas, people are crying out for some relief. Carrying out, and the member from Castle South say, thanks to labor. Three and a half years you're in government and you're saying things bad in the country because it's thanks to labor. The same people who are crying out that things are booming. And I gave a young man a ride recently. He tells me he sells per me in tongue. A few years ago, he used to sell 100 in his bucket at $2 for the plain ones and $3 for the, those with raisins. He can barely sell 30 these days. And he tells me things bad, bad, bad. I said, nah, man, the thing's booming. Things booming. And he laughed at me. And Christmas is coming. Traditionally, there will be a little stimulus program. The name has changed from step to stimulus. Nothing has been said since. I know as parliamentary rep, we've had Easter. Nothing was extended to me to give the people of Castro South. Although I know people who work in, a lot of them from Castro South East. I know for the summer, going back to school, 
nothing was really extended to me or something minor. I think six, how much? Five thousand or six thousand dollars was given to SSDF to assist. And Christmas is coming again. Christmas is in two weeks' time. Okay, if it's ten thousand, ten thousand. But my opponent got about seventy thousand. I got ten thousand. She got about seventy thousand. But but let, let let's move on. Let, I, I'm not today today I'm not arguing about that. I want to make a simple point. What is going to happen? That people are suffering in this country. Despite all the glan gl and all the flashing lights, people are taking it really hard in this country. And frustration level is peaking. Levels are peaking. Speaker, there are months left. There are months left, Mr. Speaker. Philip JP has won five elections. There are months left. And the nuisance in the house will no longer be there. But, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell Honourable you something. Members. Honorable members, yeah. member, member for Denry. No. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm making an appeal to the government that Christmas is coming. It's a time when people have real needs to be caring and sensitive and ensure that relief is given and not just to their supporters but to people throughout the communities throughout the communities ambassador joseph around this time last year they started works a cdp project on the community center i have the pictures after one year of working on the community center the only difference is they've painted it after one year of working but that's a story for another time. But people need relief, Mr. Speaker. So this is my appeal, Mr. Speaker. I will not oppose this motion, but I thought I should share some of my thoughts on it, having heard members from the other side. Thank you very much. Member for Castro Central. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to support the motion before us. And I have to admit that ever since that was introduced in 2012, I believe, there's a question I've tried to find an answer for in my mind. And up to this day, I have not been able to answer that question. And the simple question is, what mindset, what frame of mind caused a government to place that on a reconnection fee of an essential need such as water and electricity? What mindset caused that to happen? What mindset caused a government to put that on funeral expenses? The mindset. That is what I am trying, that's the question I am trying to answer up till now. And it's not about the fact that the VAT on electricity, say, is a nominal amount. That's not the point. The point is, why would a government why would someone or a government entrusted with the responsibility of caring for people find the most vulnerable opportunity in someone's life to oppress them with a tax that by the government's own admission was an oppressive tax to begin with in the first place? Why do you take a quote-unquote oppressive tax and use that to target, attack, and oppress poor people? Because I cannot imagine or I cannot think of any group of people who would be more affected by a tax on reconnection 
than the poorest of the poor. Why would a government want to single out? Why would a government want to single out poor people in such a way to oppress them? That is my question. And I have not been able to answer it. One can argue that it was not so much revenue the government was raising by putting tax on reconnection. So why go there? Why go there? That was clearly a government that held poor people in contempt. And that's the question I want answered. Why? Why go after the poor? Mr. Speaker, we all know, we all know that governments have to raise taxes. We all know that taxes are necessary. We know too that people don't mind paying taxes as long as they are getting the services they need for the taxes that they are paying. We know that. I mean, Mr. Speaker, I sit in my constituency, and the number of people still in Cassie Central who do not have electricity, who do not have it, they cannot even afford to have electricity. And I'm telling you, last week or two weeks ago, parents had to pay CXC fees and fees for exams. You know how many people would have not paid their electricity bill just to pay their child's exams? Do we know that? This is the reality. Of course there are cases and one might think that a possible reason why a government would have wanted to do that would be to what? Punish poor people for not paying their bills? Punish them? Is that what it was about? Punishing poor people for not being able to afford to pay their bills? We can argue that some people don't budget properly and therefore they lavishly spend or sometimes spend on things that they shouldn't have. We can argue, we can argue that sometimes we live beyond our means and if we were to be more prudent, exercise more fiscal prudence, we would be able to afford these centers in life. But Mr. Speaker, for a fact, for a fact, I know and I would like to think that the majority of people in St. Lucia would not want to have their electricity cut or their water cut and they would pay their electricity and water bills as long as they can reach. Mr. Speaker, do you know how annoying it is not to have electricity at your home? The things in your fridge are going bad. You have mosquitoes buzzing around your head because your fan is not on. The number of times you go and put on your light out of habit to remember that there is no electricity. Mr. Speaker, nobody would want to go through this agony just because they didn't want to pay their bill. So, Mr. Speaker, what we are doing today is very significant. It is sending a very clear message. It is saying that when we are entrusted with power, that we will use it responsibly. It is saying that when we are entrusted with power, we will not use it to oppress people. It is saying that as persons entrusted with power, we will hold that trust sacred and make sure we use it for the benefit of people, not for the mere purpose of exercising power and authority over them. So what we have done today is very, very significant. It's very significant. And it shows the kind of government we are. Because similarly, the last time we were in this Honorable House, Mr. Speaker, you will remember that we passed the fiscal incentives, the amendment to the Fiscal Incentives Act. And what did that do again? It provided an opportunity for ordinary people, ordinary people to get duty-free concessions on certain products or certain goods or 
or equipment that previously they were not able to do it. You're talking about ordinary people, say for example, who have the hairdressing salons or the spas. These were the sorts of incentives that were beyond the reach of poor people. This is a government that takes these things seriously. Little things are important. Little things are important. And I don't believe that there is such a thing as little people. But clearly, clearly, the mindset of the government that imposed such a burden on people at a time when they were most vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, have you ever had a death on your hands? Have you ever had a close family member that you've had to bury? Mr. Speaker, that is the most, that is a time of anxiety you cannot explain. You have the sorrow of the death you're trying to go through. You have all the upping and downing that you have to do, getting, identifying a loved one at a morgue, going up and down to the funeral home, scratching your head to find out where you will find the money. So much has to be done during a time of sorrow. The last thing you want is to impose another burden on a family at that time. And what I'm happy about today, Mr. Speaker, is that we have zero rated VAT on these items because they should have never they should have never been put in the first place. Today is a significant day. The sum may not be significant, but what we are saying here is significant. We will not use power to oppress poor people. We will not use power to target the poorest of the poor. We will exercise power and authority given to us in trust in a compassionate and sensitive manner. We will exercise power and authority given to us in trust to serve the people who entrusted us with that power in the first place. And on the question of eliminating that entirely, the government is still in power. We are still, we still have time to serve within the period of the five years. What is the hurry? We are committed to doing this. And that's why we are making this statement here today. Let not your heart be troubled. Do not be worried. The people of this country have confidence in this government because they can see the thinking and what motivates this government. The people are the heart and center of what we do. I want to commend the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has shown he understands what the poor go through in this country. This was approved in our cabinet with no hesitation at all because of the principle involved. And that is what the member for Castry South missed. That is what he missed. And that is the question. By the way, I still have not got an answer to. Why was the government of the Labour Party so anxious to target, to victimize the poor people of St. Lucia? That question is still up for an answer. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable members, the question is, member for Castro South, please. Mr. Speaker, before I make my contribution, I will ask leave of you to extend greetings. 
first of all to God and my family for being here for the support that I have received to the constituents of Castri Southeast as we enter into this festive season the holiday time the time of reflection and giving the time when we we slow down to an extent on the activities of work and we do a bit of reflection to my parliamentary colleagues on both sides of the political divide I extend best wishes to everyone, to my cabinet colleagues, to the staff of the ministry, the ministries that I'm responsible for, economic development, housing, urban renewal, transport and civil aviation, the boards of the NTRC, ECTEL and the National Housing Corporation, and to the staff likewise and also to the parliament yourself mr speaker and all those who assist us in the parliament to our officers who keep us safe whenever we are here mr speaker during this weekend i had the opportunity to attend a book launch <laughs> um, of a book entitled unclaimed and it is reflections on stories about relational abandonment. And I did make a copy available. It's, it's the author is Dr. Dalston Morayan. And I did make a copy available, Mr. Speaker, to the Prime Minister, the Minister, um, the member for Castries Central, because of her synergy program the Minister for Equity, who has special responsibility for our social status in this country, and also the Minister responsible for security. Mr. Speaker, why am I saying this? Because a lot of the discussion taking place today in relation to this VAT and the relief that it brings we are in a challenging environment where relationships are strained in every aspect of our lives. And I think that this makes a good read, Mr. Speaker. I will make sure I provide a copy for you for the Parliament of St. Lucia. But Mr. Speaker, I expected to come in here today. And if you realize, I didn't walk with my bag. I came in empty-handed. Because I felt that this debate would be straightforward, Mr. Speaker. Given that we are dealing further with the amendments to the VAT Act. And I know that when you're in opposition, it can be a challenge, Mr. Speaker, to sit there and see a government doing good things that you should have done and you could have done and you did not do when you were in the seat of power. They could have done it. But they did not do it, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. And so, I, I looked at the leader of the opposition glancing over and rather than being thankful that relief and Mr. Speaker, don't forget this is the same gentleman who said five dollars can block a hole. That's the gentleman who said that conveniently. But today, this government returns to the parliament as promised at the last sitting of this honorable house. I said, Mr. Speaker, when I, when I, when I come back to this honorable house, I want to be able to say that this government has kept another promise that it made to the people of St. Louis. And so, Mr. Speaker, I have been forced to respond appropriately. And so,
from the manifesto of the United Workers Party 2016. Yes. Page 2. What UWP for progress? Five to stay alive. And number one on the five to stay alive, Mr. Speaker, reads the reduction and ultimate elimination of the dreaded value added tax. Now, I don't know what the member for Castries South and the member for Castries East. Now, don't put these two together. We're not talking about the member for Castries South East. We're talking about the member for Castries South and the member for Castries East. Do not understand the basic reading in the English language. The reduction. Have we done that, Mr. Speaker? We have reduced the VAT from 15 to 12 and a half. A reduction of 16% on the VAT. Now, I like to use the simple language so that the people don't say, well, VAT is 15%, was 15. How do you reduce it 16%? So I stick to the 2.5%, which is really 16% of the 15% that we are talking about. Mr. Speaker, we have come to the Honorable House before. At the last sitting of the House, we dealt with some of the other reductions. Today, we are here. Three significant areas. We say that water is life. Mr. Speaker, the value of water to a family. And I expect to see greater changes in what is happening. And my colleague minister, I can say this, apart from the reduction in VAT that we are dealing with here today, Mr. Speaker, in for the reconnection fees, because already there's no VAT on water. So what we need to be able to do now, there are other challenges. This business, this, this business of you ten, I'm not sure. I, I, I just want to be very clear that the reduction that we are dealing with there is the reduction on the reconnection fee. So after you've been disconnected, no button. So, Mr. Speaker, there are other challenges in this area. And why am I highlighting that? Because as parliamentarians, we all face the same challenge. Mr. Speaker, do you know that if you need more than 10 lengths of pipe for a water connection, you have a difficulty with getting that connection? If you cannot provide the land papers, even if the house is built and everything is there, you cannot get water connection. We, if we are not going to allow people to go back to the rivers and use water that can cause more diseases and things, we have to find a way to rectify even further these complicated processes. Huh? That's a, for, for government land. But I'm saying that if somebody has a house, they, they should get water connection if the house is there, wherever the house is, because we cannot afford. So, as a government, as a government, we are looking at how to bring relief to the people. And Mr. Speaker, I expected every member on the opposite. As the persons who present themselves regularly, conveniently on the platform, and on, in this house, as Gouvernement Malewe, <laughs> to have supported this venture. Because, Mr. Speaker, when somebody is poor, when 
somebody do not have the means and we think that $14 or $20 savings does not mean a lot to them, we would be surprised. And that is why we know as a government we have not arrived. Unlike some people who promise and cannot deliver. Mr. Speaker, there's a lot we can celebrate about. But if you begin to celebrate too quickly, you lose focus on the other things that you have to do. So we get criticized every day for our PR. You know why? Because people say, y'all are doing so much, but we're not hearing you. I've said it before in this house, Mr. Speaker. There are those who talk, and there are those who work. We are on the working side. I know the others are on the talking side. Because their talk never match their actions. And the member for Castro is East. The members for Cast the member for Castro is East. Can you believe them, Mr. Speaker? Let me tell you about promises made. So I highlighted what we said we would do on point one. Reduction and ultimate elimination. We have not gotten to the point of ultimate elimination. But we are still working on reduction. And every time we have come to this honorable house to deal with that, it is for a reduction, not an increase in that by this government. Not an increase. That's the difference, Mr. Speaker. So the member for Castries, he started talking about who made promises and who didn't keep the promises. Mr. Speaker, records are there to prove who makes promises and who keeps promises. And I quote from Budget Speech 2014. Mr. Speaker, Modern Health Infrastructure, page 38, Prime, the then Prime Minister in 2014, Mr. Speaker, modern health infrastructure is vital to the delivery of quality health care. By 2015, St. Lucia will open two brand new hospitals which will stand as monumental investments in the future of our country. End of quote. Where's the member for Castries? He's, he's gone. He was the deputy leader, Mr. Speaker. He was seated next to the Prime Minister in 2014 when this promise was made. We are in 2019. Where are the two brand new health facilities that was promised in 2014 to be opened in 2019? You see, Mr. Speaker, I've spoken about it before in this house. Consistency. So today, the member for Castries East finds his voice on the opposite side of the house. To tell the United Workers Party government, you promise the elimination of that. I have not seen it. So where are the two hospitals they promised us in 2015? I've not seen it. And did I expect to see it, Mr. Speaker? No. Because I know they can only talk. They cannot deliver. But Mr. Speaker, I can spend a lot of time. The members, every member, everyone has spoken about the difficulties that we face. And it is true, Mr. Speaker. The economy is not where it needs to be. We have not been able to solve all of the social problems of this country. No, we have not been able to. But for members opposite, who know better, Mr. Speaker, when you come to debate a VAT bill to tell you that you put horses before you put people. Mr. Speaker, 
The problem with the members opposite is they have never understood development. They do not know that one does not eliminate the other. So if a private investor comes to make an investment in the country, do you tell him because you have not fixed the roads, you cannot build a hotel? Because you have not fixed the roads, or you have not built a hospital, you cannot build a horse racing track, or you cannot build an FBO? Mr. Speaker, in the same speech of 2014, and I will not go too long into that. I just, because the member for Castries is raised the issue of promises made and not kept. An FBO was promised, Mr. Speaker, in the speech of 2013 and 2014 that would commence immediately. You know when the FBO started? Just the other day, earlier this year, under the United Workers' Party, and the FBO will be open before the end of the year, under this government. That's the difference. So I can understand, I can understand the members, they couldn't do either private jet or hospital or horses. They could do neither. Okay? So Mr. Speaker, they can talk. They can talk. They couldn't build a hospital, they couldn't build a horse racing track. They couldn't build the FBO. They couldn't finish OKEU. Under this government, we are able to finish OKEU. The horse racing track is being completed. The FBO is being built. So make your pick. St. Lucia has the opportunity to assess performance. Are we doing one or are we doing all? Now if a man can do one thing for you, and somebody else can do six things for you simultaneously or at the same time which one would you choose and the people of St. Lucia made the right choice that is why we are here today so going back to the bill Mr. Speaker we're going back to the bill I'm only responding to what your leader said your so called leader so Mr. Speaker Water and electricity, essentials to life. The government of the United Workers' Party, as indicated by the member for Central Castries, we came to this Honorable House today to bring further relief to the people for what the Labour Party called the oppressive tax. And let me explain to the members on the other side. Not because they don't know, but because they choose to be mischievous in the information that they are giving. They knew very well when VAT was introduced, why it was introduced. They were the ones in government. They had the opportunity not to introduce VAT on the people of St. Lucia. They chose to do it. And now they are depending on the real government to remove that for them. And every day they say, you say you will do it. You know why? If you know a man cannot do something, you don't continue to push him to do it, you know. It is because of the confidence that the opposition has in the government today that we can remove that. That is why they are telling us, you are taking too long to do it. But don't worry. And you believe it too? It's not just me that believe it. It's your actions that tell me you have more confidence in me than you have in yourself. <laughs> you see, Mr. Speaker, that is the reality, you know. Let me tell you, in your subconscious mind, in your subconscious mind, Mr. Speaker, even things you don't want to admit, your subconscious mind ad admits it because somewhere in there it is registered. So, when you have confidence, as a cricket fan, 
When West Indies was West Indies, and you know, Viv Richards came to the wicket, or oh, um, most recent, um, the, the Brian Lara or Gill, you had some confidence. You had some confidence, even though they went for duck. But while they were walking out to the wicket, there was a level of confidence that something was going to happen. That is exactly how the opposition treats the government. They have every confidence that we are going to deliver on the things that we promise to deliver. And we are delivering, Mr. Speaker. So let's go to the issue of the VAT on the projects. And Mr. Speaker, the member for Castries East must not open up things that he cannot defend. Mr. Speaker, I have said the time, and he said he doesn't know who the contractors are, and he doesn't know whether it was tendered and whether we are going to pay less. And then he goes on to say, well, you said what the VAT is. We get the percentage of the VAT on the water reconnection because that is a fixed price. We gave the VAT on the electricity reconnection because that is a fixed price. A range was given for the funerals based on the packages. It can be as low as 100 and it can be as high as 2,000. What is it that the member for Castries is who presents himself as the leader and no organization rises above its leader? Mr. Speaker, I will repeat, no organization rises above its leader. And no wonder the opposition is at the level that they are today. The leadership. Because how can you rise above who's leading you? So, Mr. Speaker, the member for Castries is chooses to tell the people that the value of the contract is 42 million, but he does not know how much the VAT, because the PM did not give the VAT. Mr. Speaker, the VAT does not apply across the table. The VAT applies to the things that you buy for the project. So there's not VAT on the salaries, as an example. So, even on a basic contract, that you would expect that a former minister of infrastructure would understand the component cost that goes to labor and the component cost that goes to the purchase of material that you cannot quantify the fact until the project is completed. But he chooses to come to this honorable house and to make people believe that the government has something to hide by not disclosing what the VAT value is. How come a leader of men, a leader of a party, come to an honorable house, conduct a debate, and give such erroneous information by trying to mislead the people? And look at them, Mr. Speaker. Look at them. His deputy on the other side is there talking about horses before people. So was Theo Hakim supposed to be the one to come and build St. Jude's Hospital when you sat for five years as the parliamentary representative for Viewfort North and we don't even know if you ever visited the St. Jude site to find out what was happening and today you want to blame Theo Hakim for the hospital not being completed? And say that somebody, because if anybody put horses before the, before the hospital, is Teo Hakim that's building? Government don't have no shares in Teo Hakim business. So Mr. Speaker, when men who are supposed to be honorable in their conduct will come to this honorable house and talk this way, and I cannot use the appropriate words to describe what they are talking 
Mr. Speaker, because Parliament does not allow that. So when that happens, Mr. Speaker, when that happens, I don't use obscenity, but I cannot use the appropriate words that I want to describe. What? So, Mr. Speaker, how can the debate of the House go to that level when a simple matter like the airport and the member was talking about as if because the airport didn't go out to tender, then it is affecting the price of the project. Mr. Speaker, Audit, Office of the Director of Audit St. Lucia, Special Audit Report. That audit was conducted in 2007, and that was an audit of RDP 1, 2, and 3. And Mr. Speaker, as often as I have to remind this House, I will. Every time the member will bring it up, I will give him the same response. When you say tenders is supposed to protect the people of St. Lucia by getting the best price. Well, let me show you what happened under his watch when he was a minister in the government under proclaimed deputy prime minister. In RDP 1 and 2, under the Lagan project, a contract that was tendered. Tendered, Mr. Speaker. Went through the process and was awarded at a cost of $43,750,000. The amount paid, according to the audit report, was $133,502,000. $502,577.81, a difference of $89,752,577.81. An attended project under his watch that was tendered for $43 million. Has he ever responded to this in this honorable house for his five terms in here? Has he ever responded to this? But today he will tell the people of St. Lucia that when you tender, you are protected. Mr. Speaker, on the point of order, just a point, on the of, point of order, please. Of sure. clarification. The member is misleading the house. In 2007, I was not responsible for it. Is this constantly misleading the house? Miss, and I remember the member at the time was not the minister, so so we free the call and link. I will, I will, Mr. Speaker, I was very clear. The member wasn't there, so he didn't have when I started. But I'm glad that he came and he gives me the chance to re-emphasize. Mr. Speaker, I said the member, his government, of which, of which of which he was the deputy leader. Mr. Speaker, that's not true. Honorable, that members, honorable members, honorable members, honorable members. I have guided the member accordingly. We're moving forward. He's no longer, he was not the minister at the time. Okay? Mr. Yes. Speaker, so I was the, not speaking about who was the minister of infrastructure, you know. I said his okay, I'm clarifying, Mr. Speaker. And if what the issue is, is that his government was in office, of which he was the deputy. Mr. Speaker, he is coming to the Honorable House and he is talking. I know. They want to make a mountain out of a molehill, but go right ahead. But you still have never answered. How did it happen that a government, a government who made, went through the tender process, 
awarded a contract for 43 million 750,000 ended up with a bill of 133 million plus 89 million higher I want the member for Castries East and I can through you Mr. Speaker give him an opportunity to respond the second if you think that was all Mr. Speaker because remember he was the one who says that when you tender there's some form of guarantee that the government would get a better price and we would pay less for it. So let's go on. LDP free. CCI. Tendered project again. Contract price. 23 million five hundred and fifteen thousand one hundred and fifty eight dollars ninety three cents. Amount paid. 49 million 97,319 dollars 21 cents a difference of 25 million more than a hundred percent difference I want the member for Castries East when he is going to explain to this government how tender works in the benefit of the people of St. Lucia and that all the taxpayers, including myself, we have to pay this 133 and this 25. But if that was all, Mr. Speaker, I may have excused them. RBP Consultancy, DEWI, Consultancy on the project, went out for tender, a contract was awarded, 7 million, $402,840.67. Amount paid, $21,570,585.78. A difference of $14,167,745.11. Almost 200% higher than the awarded contract price. I have never heard, and Mr. Speaker, that's not a document produced by a government. That is Office of the Director of Audit St. Lucia. I have never heard, all of a sudden they take Mumu tablets. I have never heard one of them who was in government explain don't worry you worried about St. Jude. I've never heard one of them explain Mr. Speaker what happened under this under their watch but today the advice they could not give themselves they want to tell this government how to do projects effectively and efficiently now now Mr. Speaker no is horses and hospital what you all could not do. You all could do neither horses nor hospital. We are doing both horses and hospital. So Mr. Speaker, when we come to this honorable house and we ask for a waiver of that, and the member for Castries is, can you imagine Mr. Speaker, if the government had members. to borrow, if we had, I'll see you at the race on, on, on Friday. Mr. Speaker, some people will not go there out of shame because they've said so much. But I know they'll be watching on TV somewhere. Anyway, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, when, when the member for Castries East raised the issues of he does not understand why the government would go in that direction of the VAT, because how do we give VAT to a company that didn't go out for tender and didn't do this? Mr. Speaker, basic economics would tell you that government should not be borrowing at an interest rate to move money from the right hand to put into the left hand. Basic. Very basic. And that is why even when VAT was introduced, 
I never fully understood why all of government contracts attract VAT. And they know that. When we do the World Bank projects, Mr. Speaker, the government has to pay the VAT. The DVRP project, we cannot ask them to pay the VAT. We have to bear the cost of the VAT. Because why would an entity loaning you money at concession rates give you money for VAT again, which is a government tax? So, Mr. Speaker, who introduced VAT in this country? You see, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members. Mr. Speaker, the difference here. Honorable members. Mr. Speaker, that's what they can do. You see exactly what they're doing there. That's all they can do. Talk. They have not been able... Anything we do, we take responsibility for. And I can go to Hansan, and I can show you when I challenge the VAT bill. On and I remember, said, uh, earlier you were responding to various statements made, okay. but we're not going back here to justify the VAT bill. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, on the issue of the VAT, and what has happened, I am confident that this government is moving in the right direction. And for those who present themselves as caring about the people of St. Lucia, I don't know how they would skip the break that is given on funerals, electricity, and water, and jump on the issue of the roads and the VAT waiver for the roads. And I would really think that the member for Castries East would be more sensitive to the plight of the average person in St. Lucia. That at least by way of passing, he would have made reference to the fact that he welcomes the initiative that brings relief to the people of St. Lucia. But no, Mr. Speaker, he doesn't care about the people of St. Lucia. He cares about his ascension in political office. And his ascension is not about the well-being of the people. It is about where he, where he is positioned among his peers. Unlike us, unlike us on this side, Mr. Speaker, it doesn't matter what position we occupy. We have one common goal, and that is to make life better for the people of St. Lucia. And every time we come to this honorable house with a bill of this nature, and I applaud the member for, for Castry South, that he could have cited these couple areas and say that he supports it. But he has greater responsibility than that, Mr. Speaker. Because when you are going, wherever you go, if you love St. Lucia, you are St. Lucian first. And there are people who are not born here. They don't live here. And they have more loyalty to St. Lucia than some of the people who present themselves here as caring and loving St. Lucia. You know why, Mr. Speaker? Because I'll give you the example. Our actions, our deportment, our conduct. Mr. Speaker, I don't care who is the government of the day. I will not step outside of St. Lucia and bad talk my country because for the whole world to hear the negative things that were said about St. Lucia, which has a direct social impact on the very people that we are trying to protect here, Mr. Speaker. You need to tie it to the, to the motion, Honorable Member. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am with the motion, Mr. Speaker. No, you didn't tie it to the motion, Honorable Member. So. I am saying, Mr. Speaker, our conduct, our conduct and our attitude 
in what we say out there. Because as was highlighted by the members, what happens in the decisions that we make have implications for the economic well-being of St. Lucia. So take what the member for Castries, he said as an example. He said, look here, we are burdening the people of St. Lucia with a high debt because we are paying $600 million for an airport. And if that was there, we would have paid $800 million. What they are refusing, Castro South, the member for Castro South, what, what the fact is, Mr. Speaker, is that they are not telling us that if we gave away the $65, that we would be giving away over a billion dollars. So would I make a choice? Six hundred and and I get so if I get in a billion dollars to pay six hundred out of it, isn't that better than to just give somebody the billion just to pay them the six hundred? I mean that's basic maths. So Mr. Speaker, on the issue that I was highlighting, when we as parliamentarians and people who represent this country, our statements, whether in this house, whether out there, whether on the platform, has implications for this country and how we are viewed in the international arena. And so when people come and parade themselves as loving and caring about St. Lucia, I just have to look around them and see what they say, what they do, and how they do it. And I know that their interest is political power and not the well-being of the people of St. Lucia. But I am proud to belong to a government that, Mr. Speaker, when we come to the House with bills of that nature, and what I don't deal with in this bill, I will deal with in the other bill. Because we are bringing more relief on what we promised in the fight to stay alive to the people of St. Lucia by the time we come to the next bill. So, Mr. Speaker, I commend the Prime Minister and the team on this side of the House that every time we have come by to deal with money matters, there is something that brings a measure of relief to the people of St. Lucia, whether it be through money in their pockets or tangible things of roads, school repairs, hospitals, you name it. Mr. Speaker, this is a government that is delivering what we promised. And I ask the members opposite to wait a while and understand how governance works. Mr. Speaker, it is not the sum of years that you spend here that matters. It is the quality of what you do that counts. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Den Renoff. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to add my voice to that of the presenters before me and commend you for having led the charge on behalf of the Parliament to have us join the National Council for Persons who are differently able with their activity this morning. And I think at Constitution Park, Mr. Speaker, all the parliamentarians who spoke, um, the sentiments that they, 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 they expressed, I think adequately reflected the collective sentiments of, of parliamentarians in here. Mr. Speaker, I must also profit the opportunity um, like the members before me, to express season's greetings to members on both sides of the House, and of course, all the other individuals who would have contributed one way or another um, in making the year what it was in the Parliament and in the wider scheme of government. Mr. Speaker, I want to also, with your indulgence, wish the national under-15 cricket team that left St. Lucia yesterday, I want to wish them well in their pursuit of more glory for St. Lucia. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, 
the travel to St. Vincent as defending champions. And it is my sincere wish that they can successfully defend the title that they won on home soil last year. Mr. Speaker, in all seriousness, it is really difficult to stand here and oppose some of the amendments that have been proposed. Mr. Speaker, you really cannot stand here and defend or, or, or speak against an amendment to bring relief to individuals who are burying their loved ones. And I'm sure every one of us in here can relate to that, as has been said before. But Mr. Speaker, you mustn't understand also that it has been a very, very long year. And there were obvious signs of fatigue in some of the presentations that came from the other side. And it was most evident in the presentation made by the member from Castries Central. Mr. Speaker, she questioned the mindset of the individuals who presided over the implementation of VAT. And you would have thought that, Mr. Speaker, and as I said, Mr. Speaker, in all seriousness, I'm alluding that to the member having had a very stressful, very tiring year where the pressures that bear in her constituency, as we all know, have been very overwhelming and she has not been able to cope. She questioned the mindset, Mr. Speaker, of the individuals who have presided over the implementation of VAT. What is the mindset, Mr. Speaker, for you, of a government that will remove provisions in a budget for the provision of laptop computers to the young children of St. Lucia at a time when a horse racing facility is being constructed in this country to the tune of 50, 60, and 70 million dollars? What is the mindset of a government that will not reinstate the distress fund so that when the homes of ordinary St. Lucians get burnt down and gutted by fire, that they can get relief. What is the mindset of a government? What is the mindset of a government that will promise farmers, encourage them to go back to the farms to cultivate the land, and tell them that once their bananas are ready for harvest, they will be exported to the French territory? When they know that they're in a position where they cannot do it, Mr. Speaker. What is the mindset of a government on Mother's Day, Mr. Speaker, who will take to the streets with law enforcement personnel to chase single mothers and to destroy their trays? What is the mindset? But you want to come here today. And she had to do it, you know, Mr. Speaker, for you. You know why? Because she has been sitting there, and she has not been able to make any serious contribution to the debate, but she has to show that she's part of the team. So she stands up in this house, and she questions the mindset. It is the same VAT package that you left on the government's desk that we implemented. And of course, Mr. Speaker, there will be amendments make and made and changes made along the way. And I am saying sincerely here today, that when you make an amendment, where people are going to get relief to bury their loved ones. I sincerely support that. But don't come here conveniently because you want to be part of the team and question the people, people's mindset. What is the mindset, Mr. Speaker, when we can see on social media photographs of people who are not able to meet their healthcare needs? People are on drips, yet they are on the floor of a hospital at the same time that a horse racing track is being con constructed. What is the mindset? Right. So when she comes here, Mr. Speaker, and she wants to question the mindset of persons who have presided over the implementation of that, she really ought to look at herself in that proverbial mirror and her government. So, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I, as I said, have no difficulty with that. But a member for Castries Southeast, in his typical in an inimitable fashion, once again profited the opportunity to stray. And thankfully, um, Mr. Speaker, you had the foresight to see where he was going and you had to pull him back in the line. The member for Ancillary Canary stood up and he wanted to assume your role by suggesting to the member for Castries East that he was not re within the remit of the debate on this particular motion. But Mr. Speaker, we went back to Lagan 
and CCI and things passé. Let us confine the debate to what is before us I today. remember, that was my, my doing. <laughs> and it was in response, the Honorable Member was responding the leader of the opposition who questioned the, the tendering of government projects. So that was the reason why. And that is why I'm allowing you to question the mindset of the member of Central, Castro Central. Very well. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Speaker. And I, 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 Mr. Speaker, I would need your protection because when the member was on his feet, I think we were very cooperative. So can you please allow me for the speaker to make my contribution on interruption? Continue, Honorable Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, as I said, we have no serious issue with some of the, 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 the amendments that have been proposed. But the questions are legitimate questions. And you must understand that when we come into this Honorable House, we are here to provide an alternative point of view. And Mr. Speaker, we will never be facetious about the views that we present. These are genuine questions. The member was not allowed to delve into, into the particulars of the airport arrangement. And he spoke about having compassion for the poor, and they're going to bring relief for the poor. On the contrary, Mr. Speaker, how can you bring relief to the poor when you are going to saddle the next generation with a debt of over $500 billion when there was an alternative that was available to you whereby you would have entered a PPP arrangement and the money that you're borrowing for the airport, which is in excess of half a billion dollars, could have been used to do things for the people of St. Lucia. Today, Mr. Speaker, we have a situation where school children and their teachers are taken to the streets. Today, we have a situation where farmers are crying. Today, we have a situation, Mr. Speaker, where people are telling you the condition of the roads in their, in their respective constituencies need fixing. I know the government cannot do everything at once, but as a government, you have a responsibility with the signals and the signs that you send to the general populace. You cannot come on one hand and tell the people of St. Lucia that things are hard, the country is broke, and on the contrary, Mr. Speaker, you engage in lavish spending. On the contrary, Mr. Speaker, you embark on projects that do not significantly affect the lives of people. Mr. Speaker, all of us in here, to an extent, are able to look after ourselves. But we must understand and we must always remember that the points of views that we come in here to express ought not to be a reflection of our personal sentiments and how we feel about things, but they should, most importantly, reflect the realities of the people whom we represent. And I know there are a number of members on the other side who do not necessarily agree. And that has happened to all of us in government. We don't always agree with the position that our government is going. I understand, yes, there's that, 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 the need to embrace collective responsibility. But there are going to be times when on an individual level, you have to put your hand up and say that we are moving in the wrong direction. So, Mr. Speaker, with these few words, I want to say that the amendment to the legislation whereby people are going to get relief with burial and things of that sort is one that I support. But it should never, Mr. Speaker, be a case where the opposition is supposed to walk through the doors of this chamber and just sit down and acquiesce to everything that comes from the other side. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Member for Vifort North. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. I want to join other colleagues and members of parliament through uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, through you, I wish, I wish, Mr. Speaker, I wish for you to give me a little leeway to wish my constituents, the constituents of Beaufort North, um, uh, uh, a safe, healthy, and, and happy um, Christmas season. And we know, Mr. Speaker, that the, the message of Christmas is, is one of joy, peace, happiness, and, and unity. And and my gas with it tout janvier for north um bon sagesse avec avec nous ça bagaille la difficile mais moi ca dit tout c'est janvier for north l'année en bon noël ça on y c'est pas oui avec une alerte c'est comme ça nous café and i also want to wish the members of parliament um the 
people who work with me at the constituency office, my administrative assistant, and all those who, who assist me, I want to wish everybody a happy Christmas. Mr. Speaker, I wish to add my voice to comments on the amendment, and my colleagues have said it, that any relief which is given to the people of St. Lucia by any government should be um, certainly praised and should be, we should feel that if people will benefit from it, then we are happy and we will support it. But that does not, Mr. Speaker, take away from the debate on the matter. The member for Castries East did not oppose <coughs> the reduction or the removal of VAT on reconnection or on burials. We on this side, Mr. Speaker, are the members of Parliament who belong to a party which has done more for the struggling and working class people of this country than any other. The record is clear. Whether it be for farmers, whether it be for fishers, whether it be for people who, who are struggling, whether it be for the elderly people who needed assistance and we brought assistance to them, whether it be for schools, all facets of the society and the community, we belong to the party which has done the most. Mr. Speaker, the people whom they speak about, whom they call poor people, they say we are victimizing the poor, for the burial, my information tells me that for people who cannot afford a burial with one company can go for at least $1,500, VAT inclusive. And so if the VAT is removed, this family saves $187.50. In another area, depending on what you order, and I'm looking at the burials that, that, that are the, the, the least cost burials. If you look at another area, <coughs> the burial is $2,800, very low cost burial. And the removal of the vat will cause this family to save $350 EC. And so, what can a family do with $350? Well, they can possibly pay a bill, or they can, you know, buy bread or do something. So, yes, there, there is a benefit. For the $1,500 funeral, what can a family do with $187.50? Well, of course, they can do something with it. But for this government to come here, for members opposite to come here to, to make us believe that this thing is because they love the poor people and so on, that they will not pay $187.50 because they love poor people. That is what is a farce, Mr. Speaker. What this government has realized is that these same poor people who have to pay the fuel taxes which they have imposed on the people, yeah. the same people, some of whom have to pay over $6,000 a year, every year in fuel taxes. And so you may have a family member or relative who, who died maybe once every five years. If you're unlucky, God forbid, sooner. But most of these people will save $187, possibly once every five years or once every six years, if somebody, God forbid, dies from your family. But these very same people are spending, if they're fishers, and they go out to sea, they are paying $13,000 in taxes every year. Compare, compare this. So when they tell you, oh, they, they're doing it for poor people. On one hand, they save the family $187.50. But on the other hand, they're taking $6,000 from that family. What, what, what kind of government is this? So why they come here boasting about $187.50 for a, a funeral which costs $1,500? Good. Every single cent saved is a good sense saved. And we agree. We are not disagreeing. 
But don't come to the parliament and make it look as if y'all are suddenly so much for poor people. That is not that, that is not correct, Mr. Speaker. And the principle that they're talking about, why don't they talk to the fishers? C'est pas cher qui a payé 12 000 dollars tous les années en gas tax. C'est pas yon fort ça. The farmers who have vans, their, their relatives die too. But every single year, they are spending over $6,000 when you add it up in gas taxes. And the member from Denry North, my very good friend, spoke about what the member for Castries Central said. And it's as if he read my mind because I have all of, it, all of these points. What mindset? And it's worth repeating, Mr. Speaker. What mindset? Kick out early day. Mr. Speaker, the member for Castries Central asked, what mindset did the government of the St. Lucia Labour Party have to introduce VAT the way it did? Say, come on, they say, Kisa Kitian Li Denu. Pukisa Tutse Bagay Salatela. But, Mr. Speaker, some of the say, Makama de Mem Mam Palama Kasui Central Sala. Esli Paka Le Victoria L'Hopital. Esli De Paka Twil Biche, like Lake Tanek Web Portway. Avec même ces gens ça en l'air, tiles fouet là. L'idée n'est pas tout le biché. L'idée n'est pas tout le biché. Les gens même, en eux même, peut-être qu'ils connaissent un chien about ça. Qui a fait couvert le passeport, l'idée n'est pas tout le biché. She speaks about mindset, Mr. Speaker. And the member for Denry North spoke about the throwing of the trays. What, a, what mindset of a government that will close a program where so many of our elderly people were being taken care of. And they reintroduced something which is not close to what it was. Say Muna Akika Gade say Guamuna. Your party joined say Etrama, the kind of training that is required, Mr. Speaker. What mindset of a minister? This thing about mindset, Mr. Speaker, needs a response. So what mindset, what mindset of a, in a government would cause the commissioning of the OKEU hospital to stop? When this very member, Mr. Speaker, was part and parcel of discussions that under Labour Party government improved the accident and emergency section at Victoria Hospital. What mindset, Mr. Speaker, and what mindset would cause a government to agree to let one man own almost the whole of you fought? What mindset of a government will do that, Mr. Speaker? Qui a été l'idée et sa geste qui a gouvernement ça? Li qui m'a dit qu'on s'en a pas dit. And what mindset would cause a government to downgrade a hospital to a level four hospital? What mindset of a government, Mr. Speaker, would declare that a building which was which housed the hospital is no longer fit for a hospital. May only plan to buy gens privé, même buildings are kite near l'hôpital. What mindset of a government is that? And what mindset would allow people, Mr. Speaker, to to take even our beaches? What mindset? Mr. Speaker, so while they are saying all of this. It is very sad that members opposite can disagree with the policies of a, of, of, of a former government and reduce it to the level of insult that has been leveled here today, that the mindset of the government that we are vindictive against the poor. Look at all of the actions of, of our government, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. All of our actions. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, Mr. Speaker, I would like clarified where the insult has come from. Speaker, I think that that is Are you a, asking for clarification yes, or are you speaker, taking objection to that? I am objecting because the Honourable Member is referring to my comments and he said that I've insulted the opposition and I have not done so. I was very specific in referring to the, re, the VAT on reconnection and elect, on water and electricity. And they still have not answered the question I asked. The question is still... In the air, they won't answer it. Very well, Honorable Member. Member for Viewfort North. 
Thank you, you Mr. Speaker. Oh, no, no. Well, I'm, no, no, I'm, I want you to, I'm asking you to stand, that's fine. Okay. Um, if you're referring to the member for Castro's central presentation, you know, when you're questioning the mindset, limit it to what she has said, uh, because you do not want to give the impression that she said that um, the last government victimized or anybody, because she did not see that. You, okay? Um, so that's what I'm saying to you at this present time as a guy. Mr. Speaker, she, Mr. Speaker, she did not say, I'll move on, but she did not say that we were victimizing the poor. Is that what you say, Mr. Speaker, that she did not say that? Very well, that she, she made reference to the VAT, only the VAT. Okay, Mr. Speaker, very well, I'll move on. Um, Hansard can always go back to that. But Mr. Speaker... Let me say that the comments of members opposite clearly don't reflect the reality that, they, that our government victimized the poor. And I will continue to say that their actions have placed more pressure on the poor. And that is why if you look at the statistics, the level of indigence, and if you go through our communities, you will realize that there is pressure on the poor people of St. Lucia. There is pressure not only on the poor, but on the business section of this country, on the business sector. There is pressure on all St. Lucians. And they come here talking about the reduction of $187 is, is because they love the poor. It's because they love the poor. Mr. Speaker, I wish to also indicate, I wish to also indicate, Mr. Speaker, that the removal on, of VAT on the, the, the companies who will be constructing the roads as expressed by this government is one I need to mention. And there was also mention of the removal of VAT on the reconnection on some, some water supply issues. Mr. Speaker, I wish to say that Yeah, I, I know I don't know. I don't know how to sell passport covers either. But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, yeah, that's business. Me, me, Mr. Speaker, I wish to also indicate. I wish to also indicate. Honorable, <laughs> honorable members. The honorable member. The honorable member must be given the opportunity to make his presentation. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I wish to I wish to remind honorable members that the leader of the opposition and member of parliament for Castries East did make the point that while we are speaking about removal of VAT for the company that will be which will be doing the roads, we have no idea, and I don't know if this will come to the debate, about the roads which will be re repaired. And I know this is a very ticklish issue, and when you connect it to the 150 that's been charged for the repair of roads, I urge Mr. Speaker, and while we are removing the VAT for the companies that are going to be repairing our roads, I urge the government to continue the roads in my constituency. I urge the government that these roads that were under the Q80 funds program, the Minister of Agriculture did write to me, I, I, I wrote twice, indicating the roads and nothing, nothing, nothing. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I again urge the government to consider this, this, these roads going up to Bellevue, the Bamboo Road, VJ, all of these roads, and we are hearing companies getting VAT exempt. So I wish on behalf of my people, on behalf of the people of Viewfort North, those people who are paying their $1.50 <coughs> to urge the government to repair these roads. The VAT on water came up, and I will, every opportunity I get, Mr. Speaker, in this parliament, I will plead for the people at Fonkapesh, and I just spoke with the minister a little earlier. He again 
assured me that he'll be looking into it. The connection of water, all the pipes, all the pipe work being done, and we are looking forward to that. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to end by saying that, yes, the relief is welcome, but that relief must not be looked at in isolation. That relief must be, must be looked at. It's, it's, it's a ploy, Mr. Speaker, because the government has so heavily taxed the people of St. Lucia. They have so heavily taxed the people of St. Lucia that any basic relief the people get is welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Member for Ravana. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know it's not my leather blue back with that right. Speaker, I too would want to get leave to echo some of the sentiments that have been expressed here this morning, going into this afternoon, as it pertains to our participation in the work. And I want to compliment you and all the members who took time off to participate in that work. And like was said by my member, colleague member from Kashi South East, it's not a matter of participating in the work, but what, what type of programs and what our support as a, as a parliament that we will give to these individuals. And I'm sure you'll allow me, Mr. Speaker, to, since this is the last sitting before the festive season, to express to my constituents, my ministry, and all the stakeholders a very joyous, joyous Christmas and a successful 2020 as we look forward to continue the good works that we on this side have started, the respective commitments we on this side has given, and of course we are implementing. The speaker, I rise to support the amendment to this act. And when I listen to the member from Castries, is the leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker, he requested of us to keep to the promise that we made to remove that. But the speaker, he also, in his presentation, made reference to he expecting us to be here until August 2021. And of course, that's what I was coming to. And of course, whenever August 21, 2021 comes, if that is time frame, we'll be back after August 2021. But Mr. Speaker, if we check the time frame between now and August 2021, we have 20 months, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, the commitment we made to the people of St. Lucia is well documented. It is well documented, Mr. Speaker. And let me remind the member from Castries is, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in our fight to stay alive, commitment to St. Lucians, Mr. Speaker, number one, we said, we're going to reduce that and remove it. And here's, here's the explanation, Mr. Speaker. Number one, going, going, gone. We will immediately reduce the rate of that. That's number one. The question is, and I want to ask the member, didn't we do it? We said we are going to do it immediately, Mr. Speaker. Now, you see the difference with how, how we understand immediately means? We, we are not saying immediately like when they said 100 million immediately. Mr. Speaker, immediately means we did it. We went on to say, Mr. Speaker, 
with a view to further reducing it until it is complete until it is completely replaced by a more appropriate and affordable sales tax within our first five years. That's what we said, Mr. Speaker. And according to him, we are still there until August 2021. So which means, what's the rush? What is the rush? We are keeping to our commitment, Mr. Speaker, as it pertains to the VAT. Because here it is, for this year, if I recall, this is the second time we are coming to amend the VAT Act to make it more accommodating and to create a level of relief for the people of St. Lucia. Right. And that's what we said. We are going to continue reducing it until we come up with an appropriate and affordable sales tax within five years. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the member, what is the rush? Because we did say we're going to do it, and we have started the process. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to see this amendment go a little further. And you know why, Mr. Speaker? We are not making commitments, and we're not fulfilling them. Because the records of this Honorable House will show, Mr. Speaker, that they, on the other side, excluding, excluding the member for Castries South, Mr. Speaker, who was not in the House at the time, all of them on the other side make commitments when it pertains to the VAT, and they never fulfill it, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in 2012, when they introduced the VAT Act in this Honorable House, they made a commitment to the people of St. Lucia that they would not have VAT on water and electricity. It's clear documented in the 2012 presentation by the then Prime Minister. No VAT on water connection and electricity connection, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I can speak here today. I can speak for electricity. I can speak here today, Mr. Speaker. That commitment as it pertains to water has not been fulfilled. Because the people of St. Lucia are paying VAT on the connection of water. And I have documents here to prove it as of December 2019, Mr. Speaker. December 2019. So that is why I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, the VAT Act, that the amendments, the amendment that we are presenting here today, need to go a little further. It should not be on reconnection alone, it should be on connection also. That is what I'm saying, Mr. Speaker. Right? Because the bill is speaking of only reconnection, Mr. Speaker. I want the bill to speak about connection also. I don't know for electricity, but I can speak for water. So, Mr. Speaker, we're not making commitments. We're not fulfilling. Because if, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition right now had kept his promise made to the people in 2012, we would not be here today making that amendment. So, let me get my etual cafe commitment. You have a commitment, Mr. Speaker. You have to make the commitment you have But you have to implement it, you have to implement it. Because you have said in 2012, Mr. Speaker, that you have to make VAT on the air, you have to make VAT on the electricity. But you have to do it. And that's why we are here today, to make an amendment, to change commitment la yoba la promet la yoba y moun set lisi et yoba fe Mr. Speaker. So when you come here and talk, don't only, you have to be consistent in what you're saying Mr. Speaker and that is why we on this side, we are consistent in what we are saying, we are making commitments and we are delivering Mr. Speaker. So Mr. Speaker, I want to say that I support the amendments that have been made both in the case of the funeral packages and also in the, for, the, for the water and electricity, and of course for the, for the companies that are doing major projects for us. But Mr. Speaker, I have asked the question, what sense does it make, and my member for, for, for Swazel, Saliba spoke to it, what sense does it make for a government to borrow money to pay itself that? Gouvernement, qu'a l'air fait qu'a fait un projet Gouvernement pour prêter l'argent pour payer VAT là, 
et puis vous payez grand latterie, big interest. It makes no sense, Mr. Speaker. And as a fire concern, we should continue to amend the VAT bill to remove this. It makes no sense to me. No, it makes no financial sense to me, Mr. Speaker. It's just that you're inflating the cost of the construction or you're inflating the cost of the project. And that is a type of mindset. And I can use your word, Madam, from St. Francis. That type of mindset those on the other side have. They have no vision. They have no foresight. You know, that's the problem we have with them. They only have ideas when they're in opposition. That's the only time our ideas, Mr. Speaker. And that's why they come here, you know, and prance and say, and give all the advice they want to give. Because, Mr. Speaker, I want to say that I'm confident that we're on the right track. Because I'm hearing those on the other side speak about we're giving one person all the lands in Beaufort. And he said so, Mr. Speaker. But they forgot the commitment they gave just before elections to Asworth, what's his name? Asworth? Of a thousand acres of land in the south? Four thousand acres. Innsworth? Robert Innsworth. Four thousand acres. Four thousand. Four thousand. That's a commitment they gave to an, one individual. As a captain. You know? One individual just before elections in 2016. So how, 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 I'm, I'm confused, Mr. Speaker. I'm confused. So, Mr. Speaker, once you listen to bad men, you get confused. <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, I want to applaud my Honorable Prime Minister. I want to applaud the Cabinet for considering making these amendments. But I just want to see that we include in the, in the paper connections as it pertains to WASCO. I don't know for, for Lucille, if Lucille has the same problem. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to join my parliamentary colleagues with leave from you to wish this parliament a very joyous and peaceful season as we commemorate the birth of the Prince of Peace. Permit me to also explore the elasticity of those greetings to extend it to my constituents. My people of Oje Black Bay, Labri Village, Mont Paul, Maguit, Mont Liblan, Olibo, Laguas, Béwanger, Laho, Bans, Adoudou, Valier, Montazi, Baye, Majomel, and Herald Estate. Mr. Speaker, members opposite were quite correct in saying that if they didn't see any big debate with what they have presented to this House. And I agree, Mr. Speaker, that there was no need for them to have opened many doors to allow the debate to enter areas that sometimes are not even of marginal relevance to what is being discussed. I want to indicate that nobody on the opposition will oppose any measure that will bring relief to the poor people of this country. But for the government side to now, Mr. Speaker, try to suggest that we are insensitive to the plight of the poor, was rather shocking to me. And so I want to remind this Honorable House that during the years of plenty, when many foreign governments were donating vast sums of money to this country to invest in essential infrastructure, most of our communities were without water and electricity. It had to take the Labour Party between 1997 and 2006 to address that particular deficiency. And you have heard me in this house, Mr. Speaker, before, indicating that in 1992, the United Workers' Party planted poles at Laho and Béwanger, claiming to bring electricity to the people of that area. 
they had pipes lined up. They won the general elections. You know what they did, Mr. Speaker? Give a contractor a very lucrative contract to go and uproot every single pole and to take back the pipes. In 1997, when the Labour Party got into office, Within the first 100 days, we started to address that deficiency. In fact, we gave free connections, free water connections, so that people can now access water in their homes, Mr. Speaker. Our people used to use candlelights and lamps to study. And for the very first time, they saw electricity in their homes. It was the same UWP administration that said they refused to bring electricity to Bhutan. The then Minister of Finance said, it's best to relocate the people than to bring any electricity to them. It was the Labour Party that brought the electricity to them, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, to try to suggest that the Labour Party is insensitive to the plight of the poor is really a long shot. Highly unnecessary, because the evidence is clear. It is well established in this country that the Labour Party has a history of either implementing measures to bring relief to the poor people when we're in government, or we champion the causes whilst in opposition, like now. I heard the member for Castries Southeast pointing at the opposition and saying, oh, we don't understand development. We don't understand this, and we don't understand that, and we don't understand economics. Mr. Speaker, when we are speaking about poor people, to really address the pressing but legitimate needs of the poor people of this country, we need a sound economic framework, a stable macroeconomic framework to do so. Well, I'll use your term balance if you want to introduce that one. We're on the same page. But if you want to intro introduce balanced development, how can you take away lands at Boseju and give it to Tioa King instead of allowing the facility, the meat processing facility to bring relief to us? And only Sunday I said, by 2050, Mr. Speaker, it is estimated that the world population will be about 9 billion. And food security will become very important even more important than now. And livestock and poultry. Is pro they are providing the world's supply of protein. And I did indicate that when we export to foreign countries, we don't control the price. When we import, we still do not control the price. And if we had to move in that direction, at least for food security and sustainable agriculture, but you have taken it and given it away to Tiwa King. I have provided vehement and uncompromising opposition to this on the basis that it, is, it has no developmental value and it's just like flogging a dead horse, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, we also indicated that you need sound financial management to be able to deliver to the poor people of this country. And what is happening if you are not international airport? The opposition is not wrong. The opposition is not wrong. The Prime Minister knows that. The member for Kasri Southeast knows that. Every single one of them, they understand that there was no need to depart from the arrangement with the World Bank, Mr. Speaker. We needed the fiscal space to address ourselves to taking care of the developmental problems of this country. Education, healthcare, etc. What are the priorities? Is healthcare a priority for the Prime Minister and, and his government? Absolutely not, Mr. Speaker. And, and we can see, and we can see, Mr. Speaker, that there is absolutely no reason to undertake that, that development at this juncture in time at the St. Jude's site. Instead of completing the buildings a long time ago, where we could have entered in, two, in 2017. They are building a papi show there, and nobody knows whether it is not sleeping quarters for their friends 
who would come and build hospital and be at Ristraco. Nobody knows. We ask for full disclosure where those matters are concerned. And instead of utilizing the monies that they found from the loan that we took from the people of Taiwan, they are engaging in some demolition of buildings at the site. You all can spin, you all can spin whatever you all want. You all can spin and try to reduce what is important to the people to insignificance. That's how you all are. You all are insensitive to the plight of the poor people of this country. And believe that you all can use fiscal illusion to escape. How can you reduce that from 15% to 12.5% and say, Hey, look, we have reduced it by 16% because we want to lessen the tax burden on the people of this country. But you put $1.50 on every gallon of gas. An increase of 6-0%. How can you ease the squeeze? How can you ease the squeeze? How can you ease the squeeze when all you do is to reduce what you say by 16% and burdening the people with 60%? And utilizing our resources, instead of pumping it in our development, we are wasting it. Why didn't you our king come with his own money and go and buy the Van Tim lands and do his race track? We have to give away both issues. And we have to buy lands in the Miku area to say we're building another meat processing facility. That does not make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. And we warn the government. I remember. I do not know the terms you would refer to using your air traffic and um, but you I am on course, you know. Well I, I am on course in this debate. Your trajectory you call it? Well Mr Speaker, I am on track. I am on course in dealing with what is before us. Because that's very important. We cannot be speaking about development when no, we do I don't not have, have an a issue. I don't, I don't have an issue with your development. Always remember what is the motion before us, and wherever you go, you tailor it to that. That's I, yes, what I'm saying. Of course, That's I'm tailoring what I'm it to it, Mr. Speaker. I am. I am, Mr. Speaker. I am, and you know I'm always obedient. Mr. Speaker, I always acknowledge the Speaker of the House as this is his chamber. And this is why I have made a conscious effort to be on track at all times. So, Mr. Speaker, when the government speaks about the little things, the little things, yes, those little things matter, but what's about the big things? like the laptop program to assist our people in educating themselves, get access to education. Yes, it is relevant here. Do you know that health and education are fundamental ingredients in any recipe for development? How it's connected, you won't, you won't see it because you're not, well, but you can see how it's connected to horses. Yeah, that's all you all can see. Horses! Horses! That's all you all can see. Everything, it must be in the shape of a horse. Next time I come here, I'll, I'll, I'll put everything in the shape of a horse, Mr. Speaker, so that members opposite can readily appreciate it. But I'll tell you, you can spin how you want. The time will come. The time will come where the court of public opinion will make a determination. Finally, finally, the court of public opinion will prevail on such matters. But it is incumbent upon me as the representative for LABRI to stand in this house and speak to the issues in a very sincere fashion. In a very sincere fashion. And for those who believe that horses should take priority above the people of this country, anybody who comes to this house and believe that horses Horses should prevail. You will have to deal with your constituents. So you all can stay there and laugh. You all can laugh. 
I warn you all about the site, the DSH site, a very soggy place. You all can't even have Jack here come in there anymore. Huh? You all have to go to the Philip Massenet grounds, the containers that are sinking. I, I know that. I warn you all about the water. You all are creating environmental problems there. And then you tell me you care about the people. You all are focused on one thing. It's horses, horses, horses. But don't worry. If the people of this country believe that your priority, where horses are concerned, is the way to go, that horseman you will grow the economy, then you win. But I think that the people of this country know better. So, Mr. Speaker, I take my brief comments to its logical conclusion by indicating that I have absolutely no problems in easing the squeeze on the poor people of this country. Any little thing to bring benefits to them, but the big things matter, like education and health care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Prime Minister. Honorable Mr. Prime Minister, before you speak, honorable members, keep the voice down. Mr. Speaker, I certainly hope that you're going to give me the latitude to be able to answer the latitude to be able to hopefully answer some of the concerns that were brought up by members of the other side. And um, certainly if you see me using the terms of my good friend from Lavery, going off course, that you will, you will correctly bring me back on course. Mr. Speaker, I, I thought that we had had several discussions and debates and frank conversations, Mr. Speaker, about the airport and the funding for the airport. And I continuously hear members on the other side, Mr. Speaker, using terminology that I only have to say is politically clever with an intended purpose to be able to continue to confuse people as to what the issues are at hand. And this idea um, by the last speaker and some of the other previous speakers that we're putting a burden on the backs of the people of St. Lucia as it pertains to the airport, Mr. Speaker. And somehow suggesting again, Mr. Speaker, that the PPP proposal that they were, pr they were uh, putting in place somehow was going to find relief to the people of St. Lucia. And that miraculously there was going to be no cost to the people of St. Lucia, as if somebody was going to come in and build an airport free of cost to the people of St. Lucia. I have tried to take my time, and, and, I, and I will continue to repeat it as many times and as often as I have to, to bring clarity to this issue, Mr. Speaker, that the proposal that was being put forward by the former government would have required that we allocate $60 of the airport tax to the third party for 30 years. $60 US per passenger for 30 years. We're currently getting around 400,000 passengers. So a very easy calculation, 60 times 400,000 times 30, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Speaker, comes to 720 million US dollars. But there's no way that we're going to be at 400,000 passengers per year for the next 30 years. So the question is, on a conservative basis, Mr. Speaker, how many passengers are we going to average? And I would say to you, extremely conservative would be 500,000. 
So if you take the 30 years, you divide it by the total amount of arrivals we're going to have, it's going to come to about 500,000. I think that that's a very conservative number. So that means if you take 500,000 times 60 times 30, that comes to now 900 million US dollars. And the problem that we've said repeatedly, Mr. Speaker, is that even if we paid off the, whole, the airport earlier, the, 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 the PPP partner was keeping all the money. So it means that we had to sign an agreement in which we assign that amount of money. We also showed in the House, Mr. Speaker, that members on the opposite side, all of them, sat in cabinet and through a cabinet conclusion, agreed to give the Minister of Infrastructure the latitude by himself to increase the price at, uh, by $35. So that the price would have gone from $25 to $60. And I'm going to take care of two birds with one stone. And maybe if we put it in simpler terms now for the members on the opposite side, because you were asking the question, how is it that we have selected OECC to be able to do the airport project? It's a fair question. How did we do that? We did that because we entered it into a PPP with the Taiwanese government, in which they're going to provide us with a loan. And the loan is for 20 years with a five-year moratorium at 1.5% plus 1.5% of that. Yes? And then now, a cap of an interest rate of 4.5%. So it means over the 20 year period of time, even if the LIBOR rate goes up, that we're capped at 4.5%. And part of the deal is that we're using OECC, which we've come to the House, so for members on the opposite side, Mr. Speaker, to even re to suggest for a moment, for a moment, to suggest they don't know who OECC is. When we've come to this honorable House on many occasions, Mr. Speaker, and highlighted to the members on the opposite side, who in fact OECC is. That OECC is a company, a Taiwanese company, that is co-owned by the private sector, a private company, and the government. So it's a joint venture between the government of Taiwan and the private sector. And are, were designed by the government of Taiwan to assist in the development of projects and programs in the countries in which they have diplomatic relations. That's who OECC is. And the wonderful thing about this deal is, is that if in fact we increase the number of arrivals we have and the capacity to be able to pay off the loan earlier is there, then we can do so. So we're only going to pay for what we have borrowed rather than with a PPP, Mr. Speaker, in which $60 per passenger would have gone for 30 years, regardless of what the cost of the airport was going to be. Now, how can you even begin to think that one is better than the other? But you know what was amazing, Mr. Speaker? I'm sorry that the member, the leader of the opposition is not here, but maybe he can hear it and repeat. And maybe the good, my good friend, the President of the Republic, can be so kind to be able to advise him of what I'm going to say. Is that my understanding, Mr. Speaker, is that when he met with the IMF, the IMF indicated to him that even if they did the project through a PPP, Mr. Speaker, that it would still be considered a contingent liability. Because it's a major asset of the state. And even if you assigned it to a private sector person, if that investment went bad, the only entity that would have the capacity and would be obligated to take back over the project is the government of St. Lucia. So if we now know that under both setups that there was going to be a contingent liability, if you have one setup that is requiring $60 to be assigned for a 30-year period, which means we're talking about anywhere between 720 million US dollars to in excess of a billion US dollars, versus $35, 
and that once the loan is paid off, there's no more of obligation. Now what does that mean? If in fact, we get the home porting facilities, and we get 75,000 passengers coming to St. Lucia to be able to connect to a cruise ship. If in fact, that my government is successful in being able to establish 2,000 more hundred rooms in St. Lucia. Sorry, my apologies, 2,000 more rooms in St. Lucia. We believe that the number of arrivals in St. Lucia is going to be upwards of 550 to 600,000. And even if I don't go that far and I just say it's going to be 500,000, it means that we're going to be able to pay off the loan, Mr. Speaker, in 12 years or less. So what does that mean, Mr. Speaker? If I was doing the other model, past the 12 years, I'm still paying the $60. So now if I've paid off the loan of the $35, and I'm already collecting the total amount of $60 myself, that money now goes to whom? That money goes to the, the state, the government of St. Lucia, but most importantly, Mr. Speaker, to the people of St. Lucia. And the same things that members on the opposite side are talking about, healthcare, education, infrastructure, sporting facilities. Now, instead of having to borrow money to do those things, Mr. Speaker, we would have created a revenue stream that is unencumbered to be able to help us. And we're talking close to 20 million US dollars a year is what the $35 would generate. So Mr. Speaker, I remain confused and baffled by the continual efforts of members of the opposite side to find anything wrong with that deal. And in fact, it meets everybody's obligation. Now the other thing that's interesting, Mr. Speaker, is that members on the opposite side would want everybody to believe in St. Lucia, that we've put this huge burden on the people of St. Lucia. The member from Labry can be noted that he said that that's true. So he's reaffirmed what they have said. Okay, he's put a burden. But the fact is 85% of the people who are using the airport, Mr. Speaker, are foreigners. Let me repeat that again. 85% of the people who are traveling through the airports are foreign. So who have we put the burden on? Sorry, please, I, I allow you to correct myself. It's now about what? Mr. Speaker, I believe what the, man, what the gentleman from the opposite side was alluding to is now he's also adding the fact that we're talking about the fiscal space. You know, when people, Mr. Speaker, use terms and they have no idea what they're talking about, and the fact is when they're speaking to people who know better, then they put themselves in an embarrassing position. And I'm sorry that I would have to say that about my very good friend from Labry. But the fact is, is that there is no fiscal burden to the state. Because the revenue is being generated from the 85% of the people who are coming in, and it is that money, and that money only, Mr. Speaker, that is going to be, oh, by all means. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, on a point of order. I have always stood in this honorable house and outside of this house to criticize the fact that this borrowing will not provide us with the space to borrow when we have to borrow for things that are important, like emergencies. Because borrowing that amount would certainly put us in a very difficult economic situation. So I am speaking about the effects of large borrowing. So do not, do not come and talk about fiscal. I studied economics. I am, I am an, a business major. I am a management major. Okay? I studied both management and economics at, at, in, during my years of structured learning. So when I stand in this house and I speak on those subjects, I know what I'm talking about. So do not, do not try to make this house victims of misleading information or the general public. So, so I think you either proceed with normal navigation or you withdraw the statements you, you have been making. Thank you very much. Um, I, I sat down and I stayed quietly because I really wanted the member on the opposite side to be very clear as to what the statement is. And again, let me repeat myself. It's very sad, Mr. Speaker, when people attempt to try to say that the 
um, know what they're talking about, and they don't. So in fact, let me try to help the members on the other side. So what he's trying to say is that by borrowing the money, I assume that what he means is that the large borrowing is going to create debt, and it's going to increase your debt to GDP, and therefore it's going to... Okay, so again, I want to go back and, and say what I said, Mr. Speaker, that even... Well, but is it correct? Do you want to... Okay, so Mr. Speaker... So Mr. Speaker... Honorable Member. So Mr. Speaker... So again, that's exactly what I'm saying. So, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member. So, Minister Speaker. Yes. Under, under our project, our process, the debt to GDP will be increased by the size of the debt. But, Mr. Speaker, I said to the members on the other side tonight that in the discussion with the IMF, the IMF reminded them that the same thing was going to happen to them. No, Mr. Speaker, if in fact they were going to do the development, even though it was being done through a PPP, it would, cons it would still be considered a contingent liability. And because it's a contingent liability, would have had the same effect on the, de the debt to GDP. The advantage that we have, Mr. Speaker, is that the same way in the PPP, the revenue was being generated from the airport tax, so therefore it's not affecting our day-to-day -day revenue, is the same thing under our circumstances. The substantial difference, Mr. Speaker, is that their tax of $60 would have deprived SLASPA of 25. I don't know how the Minister of, Infra uh, the Minister of Infrastructure was going to cope with that. And, and also, that it would have been there for 60 years, regardless of whether, in fact, the money you earned so for 30 years. Right? So all of a sudden, why would I give a third party 720 to 900 to a billion US dollars? Whereas the airport is only going to cost maybe 150. And if you include now the resurfacing of the tarmac and building the taxiway, 200 million dollars. So why would you do that? So the fact is, is the member from Labry does not know what he is saying. He is confusing himself, Mr. Speaker. And that's why I gave him the latitude to stand up to give clarity to the whole situation. So the fact is, the fact is, is that there is going to be no fiscal burden to the state. So the member on the other side... Honorable members. Honorable member. Honorable member. Honorable member. Mr. Speaker, all of us need refresher courses. Even pilots from now, from time to time, have to go back in a simulator learn new technologies. I would strongly suggest the member on the other side go and get a refresher course on his, I think he said a master's in business and also in finance and that he's an economic major. So let me go ahead, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Mr. Speaker. I'm very familiar with the situation in Barbados. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about the situation in Barbados. Honorable Prime Minister, are you going to respond to every... <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I never want to be accused of not being democratic. Honorable Member. So, Mr. Speaker, in the case of the airport and in the case of the road redevelopment, the state, the state, the government decided to choose OECC because it came with financing. And the financing that we're receiving is some of the best financing that we've received. 20 years, a five-year moratorium. And Mr. Speaker, I believed and I thought that we had a very lengthy debate because we actually came to this house not too long ago to get permission to borrow that money in which we provided all the details. We indicated why we were using OECC, and we indicated who the OECC was. So again, I am shocked, I'm glad the leader of the opposition is back, that he would bring this up and say that he doesn't know who they are. We didn't know who Grimberg was. That's who we didn't know. We didn't know who Jafali was. We did not know who Robert Ainsworth was. Okay? In fact, he's right. We've had to find out by ourselves. In fact, we didn't even know who Bob Lindquist was. 
Nobody in St. Lucia knew who these people were, Mr. Speaker. So to even put OECC in that category, or Teo Aking in that category, is shameful and is only vested to be politically mischievous. That's all it is, Mr. Speaker. The fact is we brought everybody here. And we've introduced everybody that we've met. And everybody knows who they are. So let's go on. So the cost of the airport, Mr. Speaker, we've come to the House. OECC, through the government of Taiwan, are lending us 100 million U.S. dollars. And that is going to be able to help us to build the terminal. In addition to that, there is the air traffic control tower, there is the resurfacing of the runway, and there's the building of the new taxiway. We're actually estimating that that's going to cost another $70 million. So what we did is we came to the house and we borrowed locally that $70 million. And how we intend to pay for it is because we have a five-year moratorium on our loan, and only paying interest for the five years, the monies, the $35, will go now towards paying back that loan. And we believe and we're hoping, and we, we anticipate that we'll be able to pay off that loan much faster. So all of the monies that we're going to borrow are accounted for. And the executing agency for this project is going to be the Air and Seaports Authority, who have established a development agency and of also hired the architects, Healy, 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 to also be part of the oversight team. So the fact is, is that the accountability, the costings, everything are being done multifaceted. There is a, a significant team and investment that has been made in more to make sure that we're properly executing. And we're also comforted, Mr. Speaker, in the fact that OECC has experience in this region. In fact, we indicated that OECC were the company that built the airport terminal in St. Vincent. And we showed that we have, they have projects in Haiti, projects in Guatemala, Par projects in Paraguay. In addition to that, they are the main contractor on the expansion of the new airport terminal in Taipei. So it's not to say this is a fly-by-night project company or a company that doesn't have that level of experience. So I want to assure members on the opposite side that, in fact, that is the right thing to do. And what did we come here today to discuss? Because remember, we've discussed all these things before, Mr. Speaker. We came here simply to say that we're going to give the materials that the project is going to be using to be VAT-free and that we're going to extend that VAT-free status also to the contractor for services, as well as to any subcontractors. So if in fact that they're the main contractor, and they're the ones who are accountable to the government of St. Lucia to be able to deliver the project, they are free to choose who they want as their subcontractors. That is their responsibility. All I know is that we have a major contractor. And at the end of the day, the systems have been put in place in order to hold that contractor accountable. The same thing is applied with the roads. And that they're using a multitude of different contractors, not one, many different contractors, in order to be able to do the roads. And I have to say to you, Mr. Speaker, I was extremely enlightened when I got to meet a very good friend of the members on the opposite side, Sam. He knows who I'm speaking of. That is also providing loans to a lot of the smaller guys doing the drains, because one of the things that we were able to negotiate is in order for the contract to be divided so that the average person can benefit. Because we know that if we went through the IFC model, the companies that would have been able to bid, Mr. Speaker, would have been not included the local contracting companies. And there would have been no, there would have been no requirement, you know, there would have been no requirement in order for us to be able to put pressure on the IFC to make that happen. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to indicate the same thing, that the money that's coming for the airport is coming from the tax. 85% of the tax money is coming from the foreigners. And the World Bank and the IMF, when we put the tax on, had indicated, Mr. Speaker, and again, I brought this up last time, 
that they felt that if we increased the tax from $25 to $98, that it would have impacted the number of arrivals into St. Lucia. We also felt that when we put the $1.50 tax on gas, that that would have generated inflation. And they also felt that when we decrease the VAT rate from 15, the rate from 15% to 12.5%, that we would have generated $55 million in less than money. So in fact, in order to be able to get the support of the World Bank and the IMF in that first year, my government had to agree that we would not spend the money. And as such, many of my projects, or our projects, got delayed. We had to wait to see whether in fact that they were right or I was right. Interestingly, what did we find out? Tourism arrivals the next year went up by 11%. Inflation was negated, and instead of losing $55 million from the VAT reduction, we only lost 15. And as we speak today, we're actually earning as much money from VAT at 12.5% as when we were charging 15%. Now, mathematically, the only way that that can happen, Mr. Speaker, is that people are purchasing more. And whether, in fact, they've passed on the benefit all to the consumer or some of the businesses have kept the money in order to increase their bottom line and have now expanded, is that the result of it has been that the unemployment rate in this country, which we inherited at 25%, today is at 17.5%. Youth unemployment, which was at 44%, Mr. Speaker, today is at 34%. So... My members on the other side, I didn't hear anybody bragging to say that we've arrived. What we've said continuously is we're making progress. According to my good friend from Labry, we're on the right track. We know that we're heading in the right direction. And we're really hoping now, Mr. Speaker, that the projects that were delayed are now going to come into fruition. The airport, the road redevelopment, the fantastic work that Wasco is doing, the new police headquarters, the new St. Jude's Hospital, that the impact of all of these projects, plus the private sector investment we're now seeing, that solutions are going to benefit in 2020 of growth that they've not seen in the longest time. And even with that, we still have a ways to go. Because when you walk around government, Mr. Speaker, the buildings are in need of help. While we've seen some basic improvements to the physical schools, it's not enough. And even now, Mr. Speaker, when we move into OECU, to uh, OKEU, and we also now go into St. Jude's, it's going to increase the cost of operations. Similarly, what the other government could only put on a piece of paper, Mr. Speaker, which was a, a, a health care strategy to justify reducing the number of beds from Victoria to OKEU, of having to now strengthen our primary health care services, something they didn't do in five years, Mr. Speaker. That we've already started that, that process in earnest. A new hospital in Soufrere, a new polyclinic in Denry, fixing up of all of the existing 42 polyclinics, 20 million US dollars in new equipment. This is the problem, Mr. Speaker. When we're talking about Labour and United Workers Party, it's apples and oranges. You have one, one group that talks and the other one that's actually delivery. And we're very confident the people of St. Lucia have already started to see that taking place. Members also brought up the issue, I don't know why, how it came into this debate, with regards to Beau and the abattoir. Mr. Speaker, when I met with my minister, and he actually took me, the Minister of Agriculture, and he took me to the abattoir for the first time. I'm not an agriculturist. I said, wow, that's really impressive. And when we calculated how many heads of cattle that we would need in order to make that thing work, we would never even begin to think that we can do that. Well, according to the members on the other side, they're going to export cattle. I don't know how they're going to do that. I don't know. Now, what I can do is I can look from the abattoir and I can look over at Beau saint -Jou. I can only deal with what the facts are, that you had hundreds of acres that lay dormant. Nobody was being employed. There was no productivity on the land. In fact, all the land had was ticks. Thousands of ticks. 
That's what it had. Thousands of ticks. Infested. But there was no jobs taking place there, Mr. Speaker. And what we've done is what we replaced was that put now a horse racing truck, of which the government has leased 180 acres. Leased 180 acres. But we have sold 300 acres. And we sold the land for a higher price, Mr. Speaker, than the members on the opposite side sold Black Bay for. So here you had Black Bay, which was beachfront land that had, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Mr. Minister of Agriculture, how many farmers actively growing on the vine? So we're talking about an active farm area. Okay? You sold Black Bay. No. The person that you sold the Black Bay to is Range. And Mr. Speaker, you know what is even more startling about the memory of the members of the opposite side? Is that they sold the land four days before the election. Three and a half million dollars. You paid. I didn't pay range. No range. Okay? I paid range for work. I paid him back. I, I, I keep on saying that to you, Mr. Speaker. The money we gave back range was the money he paid for the land. And we also paid him a 10% commission on the CIP that he generated. Okay, we told you how much. We did. We did. Honorable Mr. Prime Speaker, Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, I don't understand. I, I don't know how many often. Sorry, Mr. Speaker. No, no. I'm Mr. Speaker, I always get confused, you know, and amused, confused and amused, that members on the opposite side have this selective memory. Us, we have come here and we've indicated, if you go back to Hansard, you'll see how much we've paid Rich. And I'm happy if he wants, in his questions, if he wants to ask me again, Mr. Speaker, because as the leader of the opposition, as any member of the opposition has an opportunity to ask of the government any question that they have through you, Mr. Speaker. But that number is there. We came to the House and we gave the number, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, what was interesting again, Mr. Speaker, is members on the opposite side have the gall and have the audacity, Mr. Speaker, to talk about the burden of the price of gas. You would have thought they would have learned their lesson already about gas prices. Okay? That is what's interesting. So all of a sudden, Mr. Speaker, a government that had a price of $15.80. $15.80, Mr. Okay? And the FOB price means that the price difference between what they were paying and the FOB was a tax in excess of $6. And I challenge the member on the other side to even show me and to say that that's not Honorable. the case. Yes, Mr. Are you standing on the point of order? Or Mr. Speaker, point of order. The minister, member is misleading the house. Really misleading the house, Mr. Speaker. The member has never shown in any document in this honorable house where $6.80 was being taxed on gasoline. And further, he knows very well that the price of gas in his government has increased the tax on gas. The price of gas, if it was $15.80, was not our making. It was a making of the world market. We did not increase the price of gas. We did not change the price of gas. The point is, this government has increased the tax on gasoline by $1.50. And that's the fact. Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I mean, again, let me hear what the member has said. The member is saying that people are paying a higher price for gas today, which is not true. The price of gas is at $13.42. When they were there, it was, it was $15.80. And what was interesting, Mr. Speaker, is one week after the gas march, miraculously what he wants me to believe by coincidence is that the, FO, the FBO, FOB price on gas all of a sudden dropped by $3. Because one week after the, gas, uh, the, the march, guess what they did, Mr. Speaker? They lowered the price by $3. So exactly what we had been saying is that they were charging a tax in excess of what they were doing simply because they were reconciling the account on a three-month basis. We have brought it now to a three-week basis. And we have been very transparent as to how the gas is. At the end of the day, the price of gas today under my government is cheaper, is cheaper 
than what it was. No, but it's cheaper. I just want to state what the fact is. The fact is it's cheaper today than when you were in government. And Mr. Speaker, I can show that the, F the, the FOB price at times when he had was lower than what we have today. So anyway, Mr. Speaker, I'll be happy to, Mr. Speaker. No problem, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my very good friend, the member from Castries South, who always continues to amaze me. You know, Mr. Speaker, there's a, a very questionable statement that he made when he went to Dominica about some conspiracy being hatched in St. Lucia by St. Lucians. And then all of a sudden, I see that on his platform speech, he has now said, well, people mis misrepresented what he said. What he said was, Mr. Speaker, is that the concoction was happening in St. Lucia, Speaker, not by St. Lucia. On the point of order, so Mr. Speaker. That is the kind the of thing that member is standing on the so point Mr. Speaker, of what are the The honorable member is standing on the point of order. Mr. Speaker, we, we, we are debating facts. The, 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 the yeah, member has gone all over. Now he's in the Honor, speaker. Honorable leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, but how Honorable leader of the opposition. Equality. Yes, that's the equality. Because when it is said and a member replies to it, the Prime Minister is now doing his rebutting. And he has the opportunity now to look at 16 members of Parliament and reply to what 16 members of Parliament have said. So, Mr. Speaker, the member from the opposite side kept on making this comparison, Mr. Speaker, as if the horse racing track is coming at the expense of, of any economic development program of the government. Okay? So, let us dismiss ourselves of that idea. This is a private investment. He then went on further to say, and I think that he means it all goodwill, Mr. Speaker, that the concert with Jaru should be cancelled and that the money that we were going to spend on Jaru should be spent on helping the people with, with, um, with their health care costs. And you know what, that's, that's a reasonable request. And I can, I can understand why anybody in all good conscience would want to say that. But the fact is, when, when his government was in office, I, I, I want to take the number off the top of my head. I believe the number was something like 70 million or 80 million dollars, Mr. Speaker, in 2006 and 2007 that we spent on Cricket World Cup. Why didn't we use that money for those things instead? Mr. Speaker, when we were spending 14 million dollars, 14 million on jazz, in which it was a party for the boys because they, the hotels were being filled by whom? By all the artists and the production people. The government was just spending money. How come nobody on the other side said, maybe we shouldn't be spending that much money? Mr. Speaker, in the last year, in 2016 for jazz, they spent 500,000 US dollars to bring Mark Anthony to St. Lucia to sing Spanish. Where was that conscience? Where was that conscience? And all of a sudden now, that our government must now solely focus on one thing, on the, on the, on the social development of our country. Social development is critical, but we must grow the economy in order to be able to do that. Having horses in St. Lucia and having the horse race is not about just enjoyment. It's about economic activity to create exposure for the destination, to bring new investors. On Thursday, I have a series of major investors coming down to St. Lucia who would not have come to St. Lucia had it not been for the horse racing. In January, we're going to be starting a hotel right there on the site. The same one he says is too soft. And in addition to that, we'll be making an announcement of a major international university on that same site. And that is only the beginning of the economic development that we're going to be doing this out. For years, for years, the members on the opposite side, I'm sorry he's not here, my member from Labry, my good friend from Viewfort North, where were you? That the people were going to just eat words? 
eight promises, how long do you think that even the most loyalist of loyal will follow you? There's no development taking place in the South. For the first time, people have a little hope. And instead of encouraging it and maybe saying, you know what, I don't agree with everything you're doing, but I'm seeing jobs. I'm seeing people move. I see members on the opposite side now, the FBO, right, that was there, that as Minister Guy Joseph said, was in the plans of SLASPA. And I believe, if not mistaken, the member from Castries East was in charge of SLASPA. Answer to us and tell us why, why a project that was being funded by a private sector person could not get off the ground and is acting independently of the terminal. Why? Five years. It wasn't going to cost the state any money. All you had to do was to give the approvals. And what are we going to do? Is when you now have private planes coming to St. Lucia, of which St. Lucia has been acting as a backup to Barbados and a backup to the Grenadines, that rich people coming on their planes have to walk to the terminal, whereas everybody else in the Caribbean has a dedicated facility, why could he not make it happen? And all the people that were employed that I got to go and see, and the people how, who's going to benefit, and St. Lucia is going to benefit, why could he not do it? Yes, it's the same rich people to come to St. Lucia and invest in St. Lucia, but you see, Mr. Speaker, the rich people that they have, the billionaires that they're familiar with themselves with, they keep them to themselves. You know, the, the point is, Mr. Speaker, the Al Jazeera story brings it to us clear. What is it? Is that there is a game out there to be able to give wealthy people diplomatic passports in exchange for quid pro quo. I am satisfied and all the documentation says it. Ernest Hilaire only knew, sorry, the member from Castries South only knew one thing, is that they wanted an immunity. That's what it was about. There was never any dialysis center. There was never any health centers. There was never any fifth wing. This was about immunity. And that's for another day, Mr. Speaker. But to come now and suggest that there are not wealthy people willing to make meaningful contributions to this country is disingenuous and is false. Only, it seems, the members and the, the, the billionaires that they know, a fellow comes in, Robert Ainsworth, proposing that he is going to develop 4,000 acres of land. And he only wants the government to give him 1,000 acres. And guess what? The government agrees. All he had to do was to show that he bought the other land. And once he did that, they would give him all of the incentives. That's in black and white. Mr. Speaker, they cannot deny that. It is true, Mr. Speaker. We have brought the document. It's a document of the House. So, Mr. Speaker, the other thing is, is that the public of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, the public of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, have become disengaged and distrustful of governments, Mr. Speaker. Why? That when we go and increase taxes, they don't even know where the money goes. So my government came in, Mr. Speaker, and said we're going to introduce a gas tax. And that that gas tax is going to be dedicated to the Ministry of Infrastructure. And why? You know, instead of the Ministry of Infrastructure accepting and acknowledging, Mr. Speaker, that when he was the minister, that he got something like a million dollars a year to be able to fix roads. How what was that going to do? So instead of now saying, okay, the government has come in and raised 41 million US dollars and will be coming with another 20 million US dollars in order not to build new roads, Mr. Speaker, to fix up the roads that they have not fixed up for 20 years. They left this country in a disaster. And when I hear members on the opposite side, want to tell me how bad the, the crime situation is in St. Lucia, or tell me how bad the health care situation is in St. Lucia, or how bad the education system is in St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. I'm amazed and I am lost at what they're, what they're talking about. We have moved the dialysis center. We have, we have moved the dialysis center. We've expanded the number of dialysis machines. We've fixed up schools. 
We've injected more money in order to be able to allow the policemen to fight crime in this country. I'm proud about what we're doing. And we will continue to do for the people of, of, the, of, of the policemen in this country. Police officers. Okay? I am proud. And I know with the commitment that the government is making to them that we will see a dramatic reduction in crime. Because the fact is, you can say that because the effort is going in. Versus, versus, Mr. Speaker, they have become a party of wishful thinkers. What they do? They come up with an idea and they, they hope it's going to happen. But there's only one thing that pays off is hard work and commitment and drive. And that, that is what I see on this side of the house. And that we are committed to improving the livelihoods of everybody. And Mr. Speaker, coming back to what we came here to discuss, after hopefully I've answered all of their questions, what we're going to answer is that while we're on that journey, we want to make sure that we can give as much relief to some of the people along the way. So the idea, the idea of saving some people some money in their most aggrieved point, whether it be a loss of a family or, for, or, or not being able to pay their bill and give them some relief and letting them move on is what this party is all about. And when we are now hopefully get this country to single digit unemployment, when we're able to reduce youth unemployment, I would like to think also to single digit. And when we're able to deal with the single mothers in this society, and I want them all to know that my government is on their side. We understand their plight. We want to be able to increase the number of social workers. We want to be able to improve the judicial system that we have here. We want to look at how we're handling our prisoners. And the member on the opposite side talked about books, um, e-books, not e-books, he talked about computers, laptops. Mr. Speaker, you know, when you don't do something and, and people continue to bring it up to embarrass themselves, they gave computers laptops to kids with nothing in it just Wi-Fi connection and even when they go to their communities in all fairness to them the GNET program started underneath them and I'm very happy for that but I want to be able to see the GNET and we are moving to expand the GNET blank so what we're going to be doing Mr. Speaker and I wait for the Minister of Education to bring it up we're going to be introducing e-books e-books in January and Form 3 and the e-books now, the difference is, is the, is the school books that they have will actually be in the e-book. So it means that the kids will not have to, <coughs> the kids are not going to have to carry the books. It also has software program, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, not because it's the, uh, not because it is, the honorable member, when the speaker is speaking, you relax yourself. Honorable members, honorable members, honorable member, honorable member, sit, Mr. Prime Minister. You, you, honorable members, what is what is this now? Not because it is the last sitting of the year, supposedly, because an emergency may happen, that we should behave because we will not see each other or may not interact for the year. We're doing everything now. Right. Just relax, honorable members. Honorable Prime Minister, you may continue, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, as I said, Mr. Speaker, this government is committed to being able to help the more vulnerable people. And that's why today was a very good opportunity to talk about disability, that it's not in the form of just physical and mental, but it's also economic disability. And we know that many people and too many people actually suffer from the economic disability, Mr. Speaker. And we always have to be assured that the programs we're doing, while we look at the macro picture of trying to grow our economy and create more opportunity, that we're continuously looking to see how we can reach out our hands, not only as a government, but as a people, 
to make sure everybody is benefiting from a piece of the pie. And that's one thing I'm happy. I like to see the number of contractors that are benefiting from jobs. I like to see the number of people working. But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, in order to be able to assure the, the necessary transparency, it is better when these developments are driven through the private sector and that government is only providing the policy, the policy framework to allow these things to happen. And then nobody can accuse government of getting involved. I mean, for members of this House, Mr. Speaker, to take, for instance, the poverty list, not enough money is being put into the poverty list. Certainly not to cover the number of people who classify and qualify to be poor. And as a result of it, there are people who are being left out. And those people, Mr. Speaker, have every right to think that it's not by coincidence. And we must improve the system, our social system, that once you qualify, you benefit. And that now will put pressure on the government to make sure that we're reducing the number of unemployed people, reducing the level of poverty in this country, focusing on making sure that people are earning an income, a salary, that allows them to build a home and have a prosperous life. That is what this government wants to do. And we're going to remain focused on those achievements. And instead of people who are naysayers, people who have a convenient memories, and people who are in government for approximately 20 years and have nothing to show for it. Everything that they're saying that we have to get done are things they couldn't get done. You had St. Jude, you had five years, you couldn't do it. You have two members from the, from the opposite side today that pass by St. Jude's every day for five years. I don't remember once, Mr. Speaker, them making an objection and being concerned as to why it's not open. Not once. And if, in fact, I'm wrong, I would love them to provide me with the report. Anything that says that they expressed a concern as to how long it was taken. Or a concern in terms of... I keep on saying, the member on the other side keeps on saying they never stop working. I tell them, be careful. It's not that they never stop working. They never stop paying. They never stop spending. But there was no progress that was being made. It's there for everybody to see. How you can go to that building and even think for one moment that that building was one month away from being built. So, Mr. Speaker, at the end of the day, I look to get everybody's support on this bill. One, in terms of reducing the VAT on the connection of water and the connection of electricity, reconnecting fees. I'm looking forward to the support of reducing and eliminating the VAT on burial services. And I'm very happy that the, some of my members pointed out that the quantum of money that people are going to be saving on, those, on, those, on, 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 on that, that expenditure. I'm also looking forward to getting the VAT reduction not only for OECC, but also for all of the, the St. Lucian subcontractors that are going to be coming in. And the subcontractors who get jobs and now have the ability to go and invest in new equipment and upgrade themselves and progress themselves in life, those are the people that this bill is about, not anything else. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Members, the question is that Parliament, by affirmative resolution... Honourable Members, Honourable Members, I'll stop the question here. Just remain silent for once. Honourable Members, the question is that Parliament, by affirmative resolution, approves the draft value-added tax amendment of Schedule 1 and 3, Number 2, Order, which amends Schedule 1 and 3 of the Act. A. In the case of Schedule 1, 1, under Item 1, to include the definition for the words funeral package and funeral home. 2, under Item 2, 1, to include a zero-rated good, a supply of goods that forms part of a funer funeral package provided by a funeral home. 3, under Item 2, 2, to include as a zero-rated service, a supply of A, a service that forms part of a funeral package provided by a funeral home. B, a service directly related to the reconnection of water provided by the Water and Sewage Company, Incorporated, Wasco. C, a service directly related to the reconnection of an electrical energy provided by the St. Lucia Electricity Services Company, Limited. D, a service under the contract agreement between the St. Lucia Air and Seaports Authority and the Overseas Engineering and Construction Company, LTDASA OECC for the Hiranoa International Airport Redevelopment Project. E. 
a service under the contract agreement between the government of St. Lucia and the OE Overseas o Engineering and Construction Company, LTDASAOECC, for the Road Improvement and Maintenance Program, Phase 4. B. In case of Schedule 3, to exempt imported goods and services for the Road Improvement and Maintenance Program, Phase 4, for the period commencing from the 41st day of May 2019 and terminating on the 12th day of November 2021. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the eyes are it. The eyes are it. Bills, Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move for the first reading of a bill shortly entitled Land and House Tax Amendment. Land and House Tax Amendment. Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move for the suspension of standing order number 482 to allow the bill to go through its remaining stages at this sitting. Honorable members, the question is that standing order number 42 be suspended in order to allow your Honorable Prime Minister to proceed with the remaining stages of the bill at this sitting. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Proceed, Honorable Prime Minister. Leave is granted. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the Land and House Tax Act cap. Sorry, my apologies. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I beg to move for the second reading of a bill shortly entitled Land and House Tax Amendment. Mr. Speaker, the Land and House Tax Act cap 15.13 provides that the land and house tax is due for a payment on an annual basis. The Land and House Tax Amendment Act number 11 of 2017 provided for a three-year period of exemption to owners of private residences uh, of this tax for the years 2017, 2018, and 2019. Owners of residential property have therefore not been required to pay land and house tax for the three, the three mentioned years. This exemption has benefited some 11,220 registered residential homeowners and has injected some $15.6 million dollars into the economy. Further to exemption in fiscal year 2017, Mr. Speaker, we also implored residential property owners to settle their outstanding property taxes prior to 2017 via the tax amnesty program, which ended in February of 2018. In addition to providing relief to the citizenry, the exemption provided space for a redesign of the land and house tax. This redesign will, is well advanced and is in response to the findings of a 2015 report by CARTAC, which cited multiple issues with the land and house tax. These included an unreliable and incomplete base, high levels of exemptions, and concerns related to open market valuations used. The recommendation of the report were for a comprehensive revaluation exercise, revised valuation criteria, a new organizational structure for the property tax unit and improved IT capabilities and database management systems. In, fur in furtherance of a design, the Department of Finance wrote to and received technical assistance from the World Bank and in, in crafting of recommendations to the land and house tax consistent with addressing the concerns noted by CARTAC report. A cross-departmental team, inclusive of persons from the Department of Planning, Department of Finance, the property tax unit, the Department of Equity and the National Integrated Planning and Program Unit, NIP, was commissioned. This team has been working with the World Bank during 17 to 19 of July 2019. The World Bank has had a scoping mission to Sanusha. Mr. Speaker, although advanced further rounds of refinement and sensitization of key stakeholders, particularly the towns and village councils, is required. On this basis, a further waiver extension of one year is being proposed in order to complete the said review. Residential homeowners will therefore be given an additional waiver for the year of 2020 
and we encourage the payment of all arrears prior to 2017. Mr. Speaker, in order to be able to do this exercise properly, it is going to require substantial more of an e-government system, a platform. One of the things is that we're going to be having a land registry system online and being able to provide information as to registered owners. Because one of the things that we're looking to do, Mr. Speaker, is to move away from the valuation process and to actually charge people taxes based on the size of their lot and the number of facilities that are available to people in the communities. And any potential changes in that price would have to be done through consultation. So whereas the group would come around and explain to the community why and if their taxes are going to go up. And so what this will do is create instead a, an absolute tax that people know what their taxes are going to be for a period of time. By having an absolute tax also, Mr. Speaker, it is going to give the people the ability to have a payment schedule. So whether they want to pay it on a monthly basis, or they want to pay it on a semi-annual basis, or if they want to pay it in a lump sum. And so this is going to streamline the process significantly and to ensure that the rate of taxation for properties is a fair and reasonable one and that the people who are paying those taxes can know where that money is going. Also, Mr. Speaker, and why we made reference to the town councils is we are waiting for the report for the town council, Mr. Speaker, in order to have restructuring of our town councils. Because what we want to do is to be able to decentralize government and empower our town councils substantially more than they are. And it is the expectation of my government, Mr. Speaker, that a portion of the tax, property taxes received will actually be remaining with the town councils in order to be able to fund their activities and we believe to the benefit of the people in that community. So again, um, it is on the eve of Christmas. Um, I'm very happy on one hand to say to the public of St. Lucia that we're very excited in order to be able to give them this reprieve for another year. I'm saddened because this is really necessary revenue in order to be able to build up our local communities. But we want to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that we have all of the infrastructure in place to make this a fair, transparent, and equitable tax to the benefit of the people of St. Lucia. And again, Mr. Speaker, I'm very much looking forward to the support of my fellow parliamentarians in approving this recommendation. Honourable Members, the question is that the Land and House Tax Amendment Bill be read a second time. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say I? As many as of a contrary opinion, say no? I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. An act to amend the Land and House Tax Act, Cap 15.13. Members, we shall now review the land and house tax bill. By way of clauses, clause two. Amendment of section seven. Clause two stands part of the bill. Clause one. Short title. Clause one stands part of the bill. Honourable members, the question is that the committee rises and the bill be reported. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say I. As many as were contrary opinions, you know, I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Honorable members, I beg to report that the land and house tax amendment bill went through committee stage with no amendments. Honorable Prime Minister and Minister for Finance. Mr. Speaker, I, I move that the report of the committee be adopted and the bill be read a third time and passed. Honorable members, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted and that the land and house tax amendment bill be read a third time and passed. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. As many as of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Be it enacted by the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, banned with the advice and consent of the House of Assembly and the Senate of St. Lucia, and by the authority of the same as follows. 
This act may be cited as the Land and House Tax Amendment Act 2019. Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the first reading of a bill shortly entitled Economic Substance. Economic Substance. Mr. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move for the suspension of standing order number 482 to allow for the bill to go through its remaining stages at this sitting. Honorable members, the question is that standing order number 482 be suspended in order to allow the Honorable Prime Minister to proceed with the remaining stages of the bill at this sitting. I now put a question, as many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a country opinion say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leave is granted. Proceed, Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move for the second reading of a bill shortly entitled Economic Substance. Mr. Speaker, in 2018, the government of St. Lucia made a number of legislative amendments in an effort to satisfy the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, and the European Union, Code of Conduct Group, EU, tax compliance criteria as it pertains to fair taxation and attracting profits which do not reflect real economic activity. These two bodies had both identified various aspects of St. Lucia's legislation which they have deemed harmful, resulting in the OECD and the co-CGEU blacklisting St. Lucia, which was later downgraded to being a gray listed by the co-CGEU. In 2018, Section 32 of the Income Tax Act was amended by deleting and introducing a new subsection, which stipulates that, I quote, subsection 1 shall not be construed so construed so as to bring within the meaning of assessable income liable the assessment under Part 10 in the case of the company, income that is deemed to have occurred from a source outside St. Lucia in accordance with Section 10A. End of quote. By so doing, the co CG argues that St. Lucia has ring fenced or is providing special treatment to transactions with non residents. For St. Lucia to be removed from the EU's gray list, the harmful elements identified must be eliminated. In a, in a dialogue with the Secretariat of COCG EU, the Economic Substance Bill was con conceived as the most likely solution. The bill seeks to ensure that the very business entity referred to in the legislation as a relevant entity must engage in economic activity in one or more relevant sector activities identified in the proposed legislation within the jurisdiction. The competent authority is tasked with the responsibility of ensuring that these entities abide by the law by complying with the economic substance requirements. Entities which are not involved in relevant sectors identified in the legislation will not be deemed as relevant entity and will not be subject to the, the requirements of the legislation. Clauses 1 and 2 of the bill provides for the title of the bill, which is Economic Substance Act 2019, and defin the definitions of critical words and terms in the bill. Clause 3 outlines the various entities that are not required to fulfill the requirements of the legislation and the period of time of non-application. These entities include all international trusts, partnerships and international business companies incorporated before the 31st day of December 2018. The non-application will come to an end on the 30th of June 2021. Clauses 4 and 10 provides for the administration of the legislation of the competent authority. Clause 11 identifies the requirements for providing substance, while Clause 12 outlines the core income generating activities which each relevant entity must engage in. Clause 13 requires that each relevant entity, except an exempt entity, must submit an economic substance return within three months after of income. The clause provides the manner and the information which must be provided in the return, whilst Clause 14 grants authority to the competent authority to assess the economic substance return and determine whether the entity has fulfilled the requirements. Clause 15, 16, 17, and 18 outlines the procedure to be followed if the competent authority determines that the entity has not complied with the economic substance requirements 
as well as the penalties which they may be levied in instances of non-compliance. In the event an entity avoids compliance with its obligation under the law, Clause 19 speaks to the steps which may be taken by the competent authority to remedy the situation. Clause 20 overrides all other confidential provisions in any other enactment so as to allow disclosure of economic substance related information Clause 21 ensures that any information provided to the competent authority, as stipulated by law, is kept secret. Clause 22 provides identification to the competent authority and other person employed in enforcing this act against liability for an act done in good faith by or in the name of the competent authority in the course of his or her duty imposed by this act. It's, uh, clause 23 provides the authority to the competent authority to amend the schedule by an order published in the Gazette, whilst Clause 24 and 25 allows the competent authority to develop regulations and or guidance as may be required. Mr. Speaker, allow me to identify two changes which will need to be made to this bill during this session. The first is the change in the heading of the Section 7, Power to Obtain Information, and the second is the insertion of the section after Section 77, which will read as subsection 78, the details of which will be discussed later at the committee stage. Mr. Speaker, this has been a long road in order to be able to find ourselves in good favor with the EU and the OEC, OECD. We've seen two different initiatives in the region, or I should say, yeah, two different initiatives in the region, Mr. Speaker. One initiative to be able to remedy this problem has to be able is to harmonize taxes. So it means that the tax rate with the IBC, International Business Corporation, and the tax rate of your local companies would be one rate. We've seen in the case of Barbados, that they have decided to harmonize that rate downwards. So it means that the government, the, P, the businesses in Barbados now are benefiting from a substantially lower tax than they had before, but that means that the government of Barbados has also given up a substantial amount of tax revenue in doing so. The second option that we saw some of the other countries take is to in fact harmonize their tax rates higher so that the IBC in fact, would be paying a higher rate than it currently was. And uh, we've seen that those countries that did that, in fact, that they were immediately removed from the blacklist. The difficulty is it means that they have extricated themselves from what we consider to be a financial right of some countries to determine what their tax rate is. And we have argued, Mr. Speaker, and made it out the point that there is a fine line between governance and wanting to know what the source of monies are, and competition. And we find that those lines are becoming very blurred as to the obligations that are being asked of us. In the case of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, we decided to go in a different direction. The direction that we decided to go and that we've, we've spoken about here in this house is to actually create what we call a territorial tax structure. So it means local businesses and international businesses alike in St. Lucia will only be subject to taxation on the income that they have earned in St. Lucia. Any income they earn outside of St. Lucia, it is not that the tax rate will be zero, it is that we don't tax it. So similarly, when we don't have taxes on capital gains, or we don't have taxes on dividends, equally, we will not have taxes on foreign income. And it has taken us some while to be able to get uh, the, the concession by um, the OECD and the Europeans in order to accept this process. And in essence, what we're attempting to cure today is to be able to add a paragraph and a definition on source or on um, substance. And that's to make sure that even international companies, as we traditionally would have known them, that there's a certain amount of business that they have to actually transact on island. So in terms of people they employ, the number of meetings they have in St. Lucia, actually who is dedicated in representing them. 
so that the fact is, is that this is not perceived as being just a company in which monies come in and monies go out simply to be able to benefit from our tax regime within the CARICOM. And we're satisfied, Mr. Speaker, um, that we are, if not cross the finish line, very close to crossing the finish line. And we're hoping that this last remedy will really cure the problem and allow the OECD as well as the EU to agree to take us off of the gray list and to bring a long vexing issue that has certainly disturbed many people because the worst thing in business is uncertainty. And certainly this, this issue has created a substantial amount of uncertainty in our region and within our own economy. So I want again, Mr. Speaker, particularly thank the members of the committee, um, members from Inland Revenue, members from the members um, from the Ministry of Finance um, who have been working and collaborating together um, in order to be able to get us through this. This has been a tremendous amount of work um, that Ms. Vite, um, Ms. Spoon, um, Ms. Rigobert, uh, and members under Corinthia Thomas in her own office have spent a lot of time, Mr. Speaker, and including the Attorney General's office in proceeding. Um, I've been just advised, Mr. Speaker, that member, my, we will not proceed with the um, uh, amendments to Section 7. We're going to leave it as it is um, for the time being because it may need further, further details. So again, Mr. Speaker, um, I would like to get the support of members in the House in hopes that um, uh, we can pass this bill and that we can become a step closer, closer, but to my hope that we can actually cross the finish line on this long journey um, in order to be able to, to get St. Lucia to be in good books, in the good books and good standing with the OECD as well as with the EU. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, the question is that the Economic Substance Bill be read a second time. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say I. Aye. As many as are of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. An act to require a relevant entity to supply to satisfy economic substance requirements in order to qualify for a tax exemption on income that has occurred from a source outside of St. Lucia and for related matters. Honourable members, let us now review the Economic Substance Bill. We shall do so by both ways of, by means of both looking at the clauses and parts. And when we're dealing with parts, we shall also look at the clauses within the parts. Clause two. Interpretation. Clause two stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause three. Non-application. Clause three stands part of the bill. Part, part one, clauses four to ten. Administration. Part one, clauses four to ten, stands part of the bill. Aye. Part two, clauses eleven to eighteen. Economic substance requirements. Part two, clauses eleven to eighteen, stands part of the bill. Part 3, clauses 19 to 25. Miscellaneous. Part 3, clauses 19 to 25 stands part of the bill. Schedule. Section 2, relevant sector. S schedule stands part of the bill. Clause 1. Short title. Clause 1 stands part of the bill. Honorable members, this completes our review. 
The question is that the committee rises and the bill be reported. I now put the question. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes are. Honorable members, I beg to report that the Economic Substance Bill went through committee stage with no amendments. Honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I move that the report of the committee be adopted and the bill read a third time and passed. Honorable members, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted and that the Economic Substance Bill be read a third time and passed. I now put a question. As many as of that opinion say aye. aye. As many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the eyes of it. The eyes of it. Be it enacted by the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, banned with the advice and consent of the House of Assembly and the Senate of St. Lucia, and by the authority of the same as follows. This act may be cited as the Economic Substance Act 2019. Honorable Prime Minister, are you ready moving for the agenda? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And before I ask for adjournment, um, I think it would be remiss of me if I did not take the opportunity to specifically thank the... Um, Mr. Prime Minister, can you permit me to make some announcements and then you'll just wrap it up? Permit me to make an announcement and then you'll just wrap it up. Honorable Members, thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister, and thank you very much, Honorable Members, for... An, for 2019 and what we've achieved as a parliament and today I think Mark or six shows that we can achieve much if we as a parliament um, decides to, to to work together one way or the other whether it's in solidarity with others or in our own initiatives. Um, I, I see that the member for Den Renov giggled a bit but he knows that when when parliamentarians and we travel that um, we, we get on well so at least um, it shows that there is some energy that we could put to good use. Um, honorable members, thank you also for the, for the fact that uh, many of you, or some of you already met with the officer from the CPA. I hope between now, I think she's living on the 14th, but I hope between now and then that all members will get an opportunity to speak to her. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister, for taking the time during lunch to do that. Um, and that we all will speak to her and um, give her honest opinion of how we see Parliament and where we believe we ought to go, where we ought to be. Honorable Members, sometime in the new year, sometime in January, we, I have now gotten some secured funding for a program conference to the conference that I'm hoping that we could get off the ground um, with a theme enhancing democracy through the public and civil society engagement in the legislative process. I'm hoping you will be receiving some information on that pretty soon. I'm hoping within that time members will participate as not just as participants but also chairs, chair various sections of, of the entire conference. I'm hoping that I'm um, hoping that the opening ceremony yourself, Mr. Prime Minister, Leader of the Opposition, um, will participate in that and also during the course of the program itself. Let me also, at this juncture, Mr. Prime Minister and members here, to ex extend his ingredients to us all, to you, families, general membership of, 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 of St. Lucian Society, both in St. Lucia and the diaspora. Um, the staff of the NTN, National Television Network, the police for providing the security every time we meet, and especially our staff here at Parliament, they all have their families and they have to stay up with, stay with us very late to be with us. So let us extend our sincere greetings to them also. Um, the Office of the Parliamentary Commissioner, the embass embassies for in one way or the other, contributing to the work we do here, the office of the mayor. I don't remember for Den Renov asked me to talk about the caterers. They said the food has been very good. Um, 
So let, let me extend season greetings to us all. Let's all have a peaceful Christmas and a bright and prosperous 2020. Honorable Prime Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Before I ask for adjournment, I want to take advantage of the opportunity to specifically um, address, Mr. Speaker, um, the members and the citizens from my constituency of Miku South. Um, I had the opportunity of being with them a couple of nights ago um, when uh, the community by themselves um, organized um, an event um, to celebrate the Christmas and to launch the Christmas spirit. So I'm very excited about the work that we're achieving in the constituency. Um, I am very grateful and humbled by their support that they continue to give me and to say that uh, I'm looking forward to some incredible achievements in the upcoming year. I also want to again reach out to solutions in celebrating National Day in View Fort. You know, we have had a, a very successful year, Mr. Speaker, in events. And we started off with independence, I'm sorry, with, yes, with independence that took place um, here in Cass Reefs in February, and a multitude of events that have taken place around the island. And I think it's very fitting for National Day to be able to end in View Fort and in the South. Um, uh, in fact, is everybody's invited. Um, and I'm also very glad that we're also going to be introducing uh, for the first time um, the international horse race. Um, we do have a lot of overseas guests coming in. I was glad to see as many hotels reporting um, full occupancies during this period, which is traditionally a very, very slow period. I'm also very enthused by the uh, support that Solutions and how they've embraced this event. I think this is going to be a milestone for us. Uh, I am very excited and very proud of the achievements that we've had this year. And I'm looking forward to even greater achievements in 2020. And so I also want to thank members of the opposition and more importantly, members of my cabinet to say thank you to all of you um, for your continued dedication um, to the development of our country and in particular, your work with us and me in particular. I want to say thank you for all of your support. And I very much appreciate what you are doing. And I'm looking forward to a successful 2020. And my last thing is really to say to fellow St. Lucians um, to please be safe. I think that we can honestly say that we've lost too many people in unnecessary fatalities this year, particularly in driving. And, you know, this is a very celebratory period where people get a little bit exuberant sometimes and that decide to engage in the spirit um, of Christmas. And we're only hoping that they will do so safely, not only for your sake, but for everybody else's sake. Um, and lastly, I, I want to say that um, how grateful I am to the Lord um, for his blessings, and I remain humbled in his, in his hands and trust that whatever he has in mind for us individually, and certainly hope that what he has in mind for St. Lucia continues to be um, in, good, in good will. So again, thank you very much, and Merry Christmas to all. Mr. Speaker, with that being said, I beg that we adjourn the House sign of that. Honorable members, the question is that this house do stand adjourned, sign a die. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say aye. aye. As many as of a country opinion, say no. A little more enthusiasm then. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. This house stands adjourned. This is where we come to the end of today's session in the House of Assembly for Tuesday, December 10th. The motion debated before the House today was that the Parliament, by affirmative resolution, approves the draft value added tax amendment of Schedules 1 and 3, Number 2, order which amends Schedule 1 and 3 of the Act. In the case of Schedule 1, under Item 1, to include a definition for the words funeral package and funeral home under the item two, to include a zero rated good, a supply of goods that form part of a funeral package provided by a funeral home, under item two, to include a, as a zero rated uh, service, a supply of a service that forms part of a funeral package provided by a funeral home. A service directly related to the recollection of water provided by the Water and Sewage Company Incorporated, Wasco. A service directly related 
to the reconnection of electrical energy provided by the St. Lucia Electricity Services Company Limited, Lucilec, a service under the contract agreement between the St. Lucia Air and Seaports Authority and the Overseas Engineering and Construction Company, LTDA, for the Hiwanora International Airport Redevelopment Project, a supply of a service under the contract agreement between the Government of St. Lucia and the Overseas Engineering and Construction Company, LTDA, SA, for the road improvement and maintenance program phase four. In the case of Schedule 3, to exempt imported goods and services for the road improvement and maintenance program phase four for the period commencing from the 31st day of May 2019 and terminating on the 12th day of November 2021. The following bills were passed without any amendments, the land and house tax and the economic substance bill. The sitting of the Senate is scheduled for scheduled for Thursday, December 12, 2019 at 10 a.m. and the National Television Network will be there to broadcast live the proceedings. And this is where we come to the end of our broadcast. On behalf of the National Television Network, I'm Prime Minister Hutchinson, thanking you for viewing.